Hi, I'm Mark and I'm taking a break from my usual extreme goose plucking videos to instead talk about season 2 of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Let me make one thing clear right off the bat, this video is going to be part recap and part reaction slash analysis. So that means... <laughs> So that means that I'm going to go through everything about season 2 of Buffy, you don't need to have watched it before to watch this. Really all you need to know is that Buffy slays vampires, her friends help, one of her friends is a vampire and they kiss and also Willow is the best character. Me saying that Willow is the best character is also appropriate for the character who I'm trying to dress as. We'll encounter that character later in the season but hopefully my kind of oversized short sleeve shirt over a graphic t-shirt which I would never wear gives it away. If you do still want to watch this video without having seen Buffy season 1 or my video on it then I think you'll pick everything up through context it's fine. Editing Mark here just saying that the video is a bit blurry at the start sorry about that my equipment is old and not very good but it's crisp and clear and unblurry for the majority of the video. This season has almost twice the episodes that season 1 did and I also made more notes per episode for this one so I'll probably be doing a little more commentary and a little less recap than the last video. To help with that I'm going to talk about some episodes moment to moment but I'm going to heavily summarise some of the less important and less interesting episodes. And because of that I'm sorry if I do miss any of your favourite or any cool moments. I think I have captured most of them but I just don't want this video to be 5 hours long. Not because because I don't think people would watch a 5 hour video about a TV show, I think they absolutely would, but editing the last Buffy video was hard enough and this video has been months in the making. And speaking about this being a while coming, how about I shut the fuck up and talk about Episode 1, When She Was Bad. This season opens with Willow and Xander walking and talking about their quiet summer without Buffy around. There's a joke with Buffy's name being Summers and her not being there for the summer. I don't think it's a good joke, but it's there. I've given you the pieces, so, you know, assemble it yourselves. You can't expect me to write the jokes and deliver them. Like, come on. Anyway, Xander and Willow kiss, which I am not here for, and then get attacked by a vampire. But it's all good because Buffy shows up to save the day, and she's got cool new hair. The next day, though, we see Buffy is acting aloof and having dreams of the master killing her. There was something mentioned about or else I noticed Buffy just being like stronger in this episode and I was starting to wonder if the master drinking her blood and her like dying for a bit made her like part vampire or something. Like do dampiers exist in the Buffy verse? We don't get an answer this season. I wish we did. We see some of our faves from last season again including my vapid queen Cordelia the show's best character. So do you guys fight any demons this summer? I know in the intro I said that Willow was the best character, but Cordelia is also the best character. I won't be taking questions. One of my favourite characterizations of Cordelia is her agreeing not to tell anyone that Buffy is the Slayer, because if she did, she would have to admit that she spent prom night with some nerds. <laughs> Never change, Cordy. I don't think I mentioned it last season, but apparently the main group of the show are called the Scooby Gang, or sometimes the Scoobies. I missed whenever that became official, but it's even in the Wikipedia summaries of these episodes, so I'll call them that from now on. We also see Principal Snyder, and I have no idea why this man became a principal, he literally hates children. While we're here, I feel like this is a different school from last season, I think their set got an upgrade. 13 minutes in, we finally get to see... Oh... Oh, it's him. Angel. I was busy thinking about boys. 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 This is, once again, the part of the show where I choose to forget that not only is Buffy a child and Angel is a grown ass man, but Buffy is 16 and Angel is a 260 plus year old non human. Look, I think with vampire media, you just have to lean into the immortal age gap, so that's what I'm doing. I ship it. Apparently, even though the Master is dead, the Hellmouth is still open and Angel warns Buffy that the Anointed One is also still around. She's too busy being mysterious to talk to him, so Angel says that he missed Buffy and then leaves before she can reply. Willow x Xander was a mistake, but Giles x Jenny Callender is the best relationship on television. They're perfect and I want them to bone down already. So America's next worst ship are in the bronze chatting about Buffy's behaviour when Buffy shows up and does some of that behaviour. While wearing a very revealing dress, how dare she? Buffy does a sexy dance kind of at Xander in order to make Angel jealous. Sometimes I forget that a man in his mid-thirties created this show but uh, scenes like this do remind me. Not that only a man in his mid-thirties would create this sequence but it's definitely something that someone of his demographic would create. 
also uh, me w- when i see willow wearing dungarees um or or i th- they call them overalls in america um we then see the anointed one forcing vampires to dig up the master's corpse despite the ground being consecrated and burning them you guys remember the anointed one right yeah he he was that plot critical brown haired child from the first season no the the other plot critical brown haired child from the first season i'm definitely not still bitter about confusing those two when i watched the first season but uh my one note from this episode about the anointed one was damn this kid is still here (laughs) cordelia tells buffy to get over her problems and then when buffy leaves cordy gets kidnapped and thrown into a basement with miss calendar buffy finds the master's empty grave and tells the scoobies if any if anyone sees my lip bleeding during this video can we all just pretend that we didn't see it okay thank you it'll be fine it'll clot or whatever i'm not a biologist or a vampire who knows about blood um giles remembers that revivification spells exist Uh, it seems odd that he would forget that that entire like sub-genre of spells exist but okay and after some research the scoobies find out that a spell to resurrect the master would require the blood of whoever was closest to him buffy assumes that means her and after a rock is thrown through the window with a necklace of cordelia's attached she leaves to try and stop the resurrection despite her friend's protests when buffy gets to the basement she was led to she realizes that the trap isn't for her back in the library giles discovers that the latin text of the spell actually says that the blood required is from the people who were physically closest to the master when he died and guess who that was You don't want to guess? That's fine. No, I'll wait. No, it's... Hey, it's it's your lunchtime. It doesn't bother me. I can stay here all day. Yeah, so Giles, Willow, Cordelia and Jenny are the targets. My four favourite characters are under threat of being killed here and I think three of them are like too main and integral to the plot so they're probably safe. But if, if Joss Whedon kills Jenny, I swear to God I'm gonna fucking find him and I'm gonna dropkick his big fucking head in a video game. Okay, fucking watch yourself Joss, Jesus. When Buffy gets back to the library, Xander has had the shit kicked out of him, so I guess that's one positive to take away. He's angry that Buffy left her friends, and Buffy tortures a vampire to find out where the others have been taken. She interrupts the ritual and kicks some ass while Angel and Xander help rescue the others. The Master's bones are apparently key to the resurrection, and in a rage, Buffy smashes them with a sledgehammer, which means he can't be resurrected. But like... This is a magical spell, like, does it matter that the bones are smashed as opposed to being whole? Because, like, all the pieces of bone are still in the room. (laughs) The next day, Buffy apologises for her behaviour. Plot twist, she wasn't a half-vampire, she was just traumatised. And her friends forgive her because they like her and care about her and want to be her friend even if she made a mistake. And... I like the first episode. I think this season feels bigger and like higher budget and they're really establishing that from the outset. I like that Angel and Cordelia are in it more too because I'm pretty sure that they're going to become like bigger parts of the show as it goes on so I'm looking forward to that. I did kind of get my hopes up a bit for Buffy having vampire powers. Uh, I thought that would be interesting but the subversion into like oops it was just trauma was actually I thought pretty realistic. I mean, you would be traumatized by almost dying at the hands of a very powerful vampire, so I'm glad that was addressed. Anyway, on to episode two, Some Assembly Required. While on patrol with Angel, Buffy falls into an open grave that seems to have been robbed. I'm also getting the vibe that there's a bit of a rift between these two at the moment. It might be the fact that they're openly arguing, but I don't know, I can't be sure. But do you know who there isn't a rift between? Jenny and Giles because Giles is practicing asking Miss Calendar out on a date. This man flirting to nothing? So true King, me too. Cordelia is here again? I just thought I'd mention that. I'm actually legally obliged to point out every time that she shows up. When Giles hears about the robbed grave, he wonders if there could be someone trying to raise the dead. Totally unrelated, Willow is talking to these guys Chris and Eric. Chris is the reigning champion of the science fair and Eric he takes photos of girls i'm i'm sure nothing bad will will come of this willow discovers that the empty grave belonged to meredith todd a sunnydale student who died in a car crash 
That night, Cordelia gets freaked out while walking to her car and hides in a bin. Sorry, this is an American show, so dumpster. And when she's about to get out, Angel shows up. He offers to help her, but as she's climbing out, she finds a human hand and on closer inspection, other body parts too. This girl found so many body parts last season, like, can she not get a break? Why are these terrible things always happening to me? I want to point out that in this library scene, Willow's whole outfit could just be worn today and it would be the trendiest thing out there. She is serving. When the Scoobies hear about the body parts, they decide to search science students' lockers for anything suspicious. And nobody is surprised when Chris and Eric's lockers have shady shit in them. I mean, the characters might have been surprised, but I wasn't. Nobody moved, nobody yassed. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not Mike's Mike, I can't do what he does. Someone who I had dinner with yesterday did actually tell me that I kind of looked like Mike's Mike, and I took that as a compliment. <laughs> Turns out they were doing a Frankenstein. No more mystery guys, pack it in. The answer was Frankenstein. But wait, there's another crease in the story. Their abomination needs a head, and while Chris and Eric are choosing between Cordelia, Buffy, and Willow, Chris's resurrected corpse of a brother, Daryl, comes out of the shadows and chooses Cordelia. This poor girl is the target of bad guys again. I, I'm not insulting him, by the way. Um, this man is literally a resurrected corpse. It turns out Daryl was a popular and successful football player who died in a hiking accident and was resurrected by his brother. But now Daryl's lonely and so Chris is trying to stitch him up a companion. How sweet. Anyway, let's forget about that because the real storyline is happening right here as Giles asks Miss Calendar out. Hell yes. But he stumbles over himself. No! But then she asks him to go to the football game with her anyway. Hell yes! We got there in the end, folks. This is what it's all been leading up to. They decide to go search Eric and Chris's houses separately, but Giles chooses his date over going to the very dangerous man's house with Buffy. I mean, for Miss Calendar, I'd make the same choice. Buffy stops the bad guys from kidnapping Cordelia and then discovers that Frankenbrother is on the loose. Also, Chris has kind of changed sides to work with Buffy, so Eric and Daryl are the bad guys now. We then cut to the football game, and I'm honestly surprised that it took 14 episodes of an American high school show before we got to see one of these. My favourite thing about this is Giles talking shit about American football and saying that rugby is better, and I mean, the man said it, not me. We actually get a pretty sad moment with Daryl watching all of the football happening from below the bleachers, and I think the actor is quite good for a small bit part as teen Frankenstein. But after empathising with him for a second, I then remember that he's literally kidnapping a girl to murder her because he's horny. And yeah, he kidnaps Cordy. By the way, Charisma Carpenter has a set of lungs on her, she can scream with the best of them. Buffy stops Eric and Daryl before they can cut Cordelia's head off and then fights Daryl while Xander saves Cordelia. And Giles, Jenny and Willow watch very concerned. They're helping too, in their own way. At some stage a fire starts because it's Frankenstein, of course it does, and Chris stops Daryl from killing Buffy. Daryl then sees the body that was going to be his conjugal corpse going up in flames, so he goes to be with her forever. Conjugal corpse is maybe the worst two words that I have decided to put together. Listen, I haven't read Mary Shelley's original novel, but if it's anything like this, then I need to get on it. I can't wait to hear her write about how cool rugby is. <laughs> In the aftermath, Angel shows up for like three seconds to ask if everyone's okay. Giles and Jenny talk about a second date. Just kiss already, damn it. And Xander gets this moment. What you did in there was really brave and heroic, and I just wanted to tell you if there's anything I could ever do to- Do you mind? We're talking here. And like, is it just me or are they foreshadowing a Xander Cordelia romance? Because I, I would not be okay with that. Angel and Buffy get a nice little scene at the end and Angel drops this line when talking about being jealous of Xander. He gets to see you in the sunlight. I simply can't deny it. I ship them. I think they have great chemistry. I think it's kind of funny that Angel, like, isn't around for the whole episode, and then they're like, oh shit, he's important this season. We have to have him show up. Don't get me wrong, I'm happy to have it, and I know we're gonna get even more of him as we go on. And do you know who else we're going to get more of? Spike, baby. Here he is. Episode 3, School Hard. 
shit, I gotta take my B-reel. The thing about B-reel is that I put my foot in all my B-reels. Okay, that's kind of funny. <laughs> the intro of this episode sets up that Buffy is a troublemaker, but not as bad as this girl, Sheila. As punishment, Principal Snyder puts the two of them in charge of organising parent-teacher night in the school. And like, that's going to be a plot point for this episode, but I think the more important thing to focus on is the introduction of who I believe is the most fan favourite of all fan favourite Buffy characters, Spike. So Spike is a cool, car-driving, cigarette-smoking vampire, and he's come to town to tell everyone in this abandoned warehouse that he's going to kill the Slayer because he's killed two before already. Wait a minute. Not going out in sunlight, wearing leather, hanging out in an abandoned warehouse, and talking about how much they hate some kids in the local high school. Are these vampires just emo teenagers? I mean, this one literally is a child, but that's not the point. The Anointed One, by the way, has said that whoever manages to kill the Slayer will take the Master's place since he's double extra dead now and definitely not coming back. And he agrees to let Spike try and kill her. We also get introduced to Drusilla, whose thing is that she's kind of weird and also psychic. She and Spike are in love too, and he's very protective of her. I want to take a second here to point out that Spike and Drusilla speak with accents which I believe are supposed to be British. Like, I am pretty sure that Drusilla's actor is trying to go for a Cockney accent. Look at all the people. But it's honestly anyone's guess as to what James Marsters was trying to do. You're that anointed guy. I read about you. I actually genuinely could not stop laughing every time he opened his mouth in the first episode because I realised that he sounds like Matt Berry's character in Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, which if you haven't seen, I would recommend very highly, but it might also ruin the way that you hear Spike talk forever. Yeah, he's the big noise in these parts, anointed and all that. So what happened between you and this Renwick customer? I also made a note that he looks like a member of NSYNC, which I, I think is just because of the hair, really. Apparently, on top of parent-teacher night coming up this week, Saturday is the night of St. Vigius, which is bad, I guess. Spike is at the bronze now, presumably because he really likes late 90s alt-rock. And after slow-clapping Buffy killing another vampire, then leaving, he goes and finds Sheila, the troublemaker from earlier. It turns out Angel knows Spike and says he's a bad dude. Then Angel does a Batman and disappears when Giles turns around to ask him a question. Do not anger the Ripper, Angel. Oh, whoops. Wait, no, that's, um, that's later in the season. Don't worry, we'll get there. Spike tells Drusilla that the Hellmouth will restore her, so I guess that's why they came to Sunnydale. Then Drusilla kills Sheila. Cordelia is helping out with steak carving, and I love that she's just here now, being part of the gang. I will never be upset with more Cordelia, so I'm happy for her to be carving steaks and saying funny lines in the library at all times. Does anybody remember when Saturday night meant date night? You sure don't. After Buffy trying to keep them apart, her mom Joyce and Principal Snyder talk in his office, which doesn't seem to go well. But before Joyce can bring Buffy to the car, Spike attacks the school. What can I say? Good mic. Buffy leaves her mom and Snyder in a room while she goes and gets some weapons from the library. I didn't make this connection until the second time that I watched the episode to write this script, but hear me out. Buffy gets some weapons and has a plan to take these people out one by one, and then we see her crawling through some vents. Is this episode just Die Hard? Angel shows up acting like old buddies with Spike while holding Xander in a headlock. You and he were buddies, weren't you? My favourite part of this is that he didn't actually tell Xander before he did it, so Xander is there like genuinely believing that Angel is actually evil and has been lying this whole time. <laughs> silly Xander, evil Angel, that's not going to happen this season. Oh, and quick note, Sheila's a vampire now. Spike sees through Angel's act and says... Uh, this... You were my sire, man! You were my Yoda! Then Spike and Buffy face off, and just when it looks all over for Buffy, it's Joyce with the steel chair! Well, th not the steel chair, the flat part of a fire axe, but it works. Spike runs away. 
women. Outside, the best ship ever sails a little further downstream, Joyce and Buffy have a sweet moment and Principal Snyder, well, this official looking guy asks him what to tell the media people about what happened. Gang related, PCP? But you have in mind the truth. Wait, what? He knows? He knows? How long has he known? What the fuck was happening in Principal Snyder's story? Then back at the warehouse, Spike does his best Artemi Barak impression and kills a child. I'm not really too sad about the anointed one being dead to be honest. It feels now like he only existed into the second season so he could be killed by the bigger, badder villain. Spike also mentions in this ending that a slayer with family and friends wasn't in the brochure. Buffy isn't strong because of her training or her wits, those are great, but she's strongest because of her support network, which slayers aren't supposed to have. And this is something we'll see a lot in this show, so, you know, ke keep an eye out for theme themes. This show has them. Episode 4, Inca Mummy Girl. Just to take a quick time out, I've been going through each of the episodes up to this point pretty in-depth. And this is because, you know, we're setting up the season and it's good to talk about these ones for context. But this next one will be my first extra summarised video. I'm not gonna say that this episode is bad per se, but um, I definitely have a lot less to say about it than the other ones, so we're going to absolutely breeze through it. Here's all the plot that you need, and then I'll mention anything that I want to from it. An Incan mummy rises from the grave, kills people, Xander falls in love with her, and then she dies. Okay, now that that's done, here are two things that I wanted to mention from my notes. This episode plays on the plot point of Xander and Willow maybe being interested in each other. Willow doesn't like Xander being interested in the mummy girl, who looks like a regular person, just FYI. Uh, I didn't mention that, but they don't find out she's a mummy until like near the end. I almost said a vampire. No, this is one of the few episodes without vampires. But I still don't think the show has done a good job at showing why Willow is interested in Xander romantically. Especially because this episode actually shows Xander having much more chemistry with the mummy girl. Him and Willow are fine as friends, but I just don't buy the will they won't they thing in the slightest. Though it would not surprise me if anyone's justification for this was the age old lie that uh, men and women can't be friends. God I hate the gender binary. <laughs> Anyway, the second thing is that in this episode, we meet Oz. Oz isn't like other boys. He's a short king who plays guitar and has his nails painted. Even before I watched the show, I knew that Seth Green was in it, but I wasn't sure when or for how long. I also know that he's meant to be a fan favourite character and a love interest for Willow, so they need to hurry up and meet already, then she can forget about Xander. Speaking of Willow, this episode is also where I made a note that I think Willow is a Pisces. I am 100% projecting here, but she's just so good at being like dreamy and sensitive sensitive and at pining after people. Very Pisces coded of her, I would know. I'm also not sure exactly which line prompted this, but I did make a note that Alison Hannigan's line deliveries continue to be the lifeblood of this show. In case you were wondering by the way, yes, the last act of this episode does involve a lot of white people dressed up as non-white cultures and, oh whoops, look at the time. Episode 5, Reptile Boy. We've got a cult episode on our hands, ladies. I'm kind of surprised that it took this long to get an episode about cults, but... Well, actually, we're only like 17 episodes into this show, but a cult feels like a good fit. But we're going to be going for another extra short summary here. Buffy and Cordelia get involved with some college guys who turn out to be part of a cult that gathers human sacrifices for a half-snake man they revere named Makita. I've mentioned already about the age gap between Buffy and Angel, but this episode also has non-vampire age gaps. Near the beginning, this not-like-other-boys college senior hits on the 16-year-old Buffy. I don't know the US university system well, but this guy is like... 21 hitting on a 16 year old right at first just because of like when it came out i was thinking that maybe it was too much for me to hope that this show would tackle like age gaps and power dynamic especially with gender as well involved but then i thought like is this something that was accepted at the time and if so, is it still accepted? Personally, I think it's weird and not okay. And while it does turn out that these guys were looking for human sacrifices, the show does nothing to like challenge the initial assumption that college guys were 
picking up high schoolers at a high school. Like, is that normal in California? Anyway, some highlights from this episode include a nice little one episode arc between Buffy and Giles. Giles, who has been pushing Buffy towards her slaying duties, learns that he should maybe lay off a little bit. During a sparring session, he also tells Buffy that he won't pull any punches right before she embarrasses him, and I love that he keeps coming at her with confidence, even though she always beats his ass. I love my nerdy librarian surrogate father. Uh, I mean, Buffy's. Buffy's uh, surrogate father. Buffy, a teenage girl, also says the word EGADS in this episode, just in case you forgot that this was a Joss Whedon created show. Also, later on at the party, there are fraternity pledges dressed like maids going around the house, and, um, this is meant to be a bad thing? Uh, okay, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, let's move on. Willow has a fun scene where she asks Angel how he shaves since he has no reflection, which he doesn't answer by the way, I'm still waiting for that. And then she gives out to Giles and Angel, one for putting pressure on Buffy and the other for being aloof towards her. Oh, and it goes without saying, but Cordelia is a delight as always. You guys, I just hate you guys. This episode does have one contribution to the overarching plot. Buffy talks about a dream she had with Angel in it in a way that sounds like it was sexual. And then later, Angel talks about how if they get involved, one thing will lead to another and that could be bad. This is sowing some seeds for a bigger moment later on. But by the end, they do decide to go for a coffee together. Episode 6, Halloween. If a cult episode seemed like a good idea for Buffy, a Halloween one is a no-brainer. This episode begins with Buffy fighting and killing one vampire while another vampire uses a camcorder to record it, for some reason. Then Buffy arrives at the bronze right when Angel is laughing at something Cordelia said and she literally just turns to walk out again. Angel stops her saying that he thought they had a date and Buffy says that dates are things for normal girls, not her. Then she leaves. To take a break from the episode for a second, this part felt interesting to me because I finished the last episode thinking that Buffy wanted to have a date with Angel. This idea of dates only being for normal girls is introduced for the first time in this episode. This is a prime example of where this show's writing feels very different to me compared to something more modern. This show is written like something that aired week to week and which had a certain amount of episodes that it had to fill because it was. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, it just contrasts to how so many shows are written now in a way that I find interesting to look back on. I'm sure we're all well aware of how TV has evolved to the point where most of the most popular shows now are basically just long-form movies, and many of them have less episodes per season with more season-spanning plots. But Buffy came out in a time where week-to-week -week stories were the standard, and in my brief research it seems to be considered one of the first shows to really tackle broader season-long stories. That's really cool and like a demonstrable step from how the medium of TV used to be used to how it's used now. That's not to say that there still aren't shows today that write mostly self-contained episodes, but when it comes to the biggest shows on TV, the ones that have the most cultural impact like Game of Thrones or Succession have, those are epic series with continuous storylines. That's the style that's been in fashion for a while now and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. So while it's cool to hear that Buffy helped pioneer that style, going back to earlier, this is an example of writing that still feels like that older style of TV to me. Again, not a bad thing necessarily, but it still ends up with me feeling like Buffy and Angel's relationship, which I thought had some development, has now regressed. And uh, before any comments come in telling me how relationships work, uh, yeah, I understand that that can happen in an actual real relationship. I swear, I mean, you know, I'm a stud who has three super cool, hot, weed-smoking partners who you haven't met, they live in Canada, um, so I would know. It just, it doesn't feel like this was written to be an intentional moment of regression. What it does feel like to me is that this small one-episode conflict that is being introduced here and will probably be resolved before the end of the episode is almost getting in the way of the more overarching character development. This is more of a quirk of the format though, not necessarily like a hugely negative thing. It's actually almost kind of novel for me because I've become so used to TV shows where continuity 
comedy is incredibly important. This is a fun aspect of watching a show that's from a little bit before the style of shows that I'm more used to. Anyway, that whole section was for the people who commented on the last video that they wanted more analysis about the show. Okay, back at Sunnydale High School, our three main besties are forced to sign up to a program where they babysit young kids while the kids go trick-or-treating. Buffy had been planning to stay in for the night, as according to Giles, vampires also stay in on Halloween for some reason. I thought they would explain that, but uh, no, they don't. A guy named Larry asks Xander if Buffy is his girlfriend, then makes a few crude comments about her. When Larry is about to punch Xander, who didn't like the comments, Buffy steps in and overpowers Larry. Xander's reaction to this, of course, and look, Xander defenders out there, I am sorry that this is the man you're stuck with. Xander's reaction to this is to be upset because he was defended by a girl, and apparently this will make him a sissy. His word. Willow is right. Boys are so fragile. After Willow asks about the date last night, she and Buffy decide to steal Giles' journal which has notes on Angel in it. And inside they find a drawing of a noblewoman and the date 1775. While Buffy laments not having the life of ball gowns and servants, Cordelia comes in and asks about Angel. She thinks Buffy is trying to scare her off when Buffy says that Angel is a vampire and she drops this line. Look, Buffy, you may be hot stuff when it comes to demonology or whatever, but when it comes to dating, I'm the slayer. Yeah, same. She's just like me. For real, for real. At a Halloween costume shop, Willow gets a ghost costume and Buffy tells her she should wear something sexy instead to get noticed. For something topical to 1997, might I suggest... Sexy door from the Titanic? I think that's got legs. Well, no, sorry, it's a door, it doesn't. Xander shows up with a toy gun and some fatigues he got from an army surplus store. And then Buffy is distracted by an ornate dress which the British man, who I really hope owns this shop, insists she take. I think this guy is actually British, unlike Spike, who's watching back the video of Buffy fighting from earlier in the vampire's warehouse, hoping he can learn how to beat her. Drusilla's there too, and she's had a vision that Buffy will be made weak on Halloween because of someone new who's shown up to change it all. Then it cuts to the store owner from earlier doing some kind of ritual of chaos with his own blood in front of a weird statue. You can never trust the British, except Giles. I'm sure he's got no weird secrets. Buffy, Xander and Willow get ready for trick-or-treating. Buffy is a noblewoman, Xander is a soldier, and Willow... Well, Buffy has dressed her in sexy clothes and dark makeup, but I'm not sure if this is meant to be a specific costume. Also, I know that friends should encourage friends out of their comfort zones in a positive way, but I feel like Buffy gets a little too pushy with Willow's costume. The girl is noticeably uncomfortable. Anyway, she gets embarrassed when Xander arrives and puts on her ghost costume over it. Back at school, the Scoobies get assigned the kids who they have to look after for the evening, but more importantly, we see Oz again. Specifically, we get a missed connection moment where Oz talks about meeting a nice girl, then walks into Willow who is unrecognisable because she's dressed as a ghost. This show is spoon feeding us this ship and let me tell you, I am eating it up. The Halloween shopkeeper finishes his ritual while everyone is trick-or-treating and we get the main hook of this episode. Everyone suddenly becomes their costumes. Including this child who becomes a monster and chokes this old woman. This premise? Fucking rules. It's a simple idea, set up well in the first half of the episode, and executed well too. I really loved it. This means now too that Willow is a ghost, Xander is a soldier, and Buffy is like a southern belle from 1775? I don't know. It just Let's just go with it. The first conversation with these three showcases where the episode really shines for me. Willow kind of becomes the protagonist since she's a ghost, but she's still herself. But Buffy and Xander become their costumes fully. This means neither of them knows Willow or each other and knows nothing about the Slayer or demons. Also, Xander's personality is totally changed to a no-nonsense serious soldier, while the first thing we see Buffy do is faint. I imagine it was a lot of fun for the actors to play like totally different characters in this part of the episode. The gang hole up in Buffy's house and help Cordelia, who is just in costume, she hasn't transformed into a cat or forgotten who she is. Willow goes out to get help and Angel shows up, happy that everyone's okay, only for Xander and Buffy to ask who he is. 
Buffy then runs away from Angel who's just trying to protect her when she sees his vampire form. Willow fills Giles in on what's happening and mentions that Cordelia bought her costume from Party Town, but everyone who turned into their costumes bought theirs at the new shop, Ethan's. Actually, wait a minute. Hi, I'm Mark, I'm recording right now. I actually think there's a plot hole here, because didn't Xander buy his stuff from the Army Surplus store? Um, I don't know. Huh, interesting. I love Buffy as a main character, and it's great that at the time this was released, the show had a woman lead with so much agency, but I do enjoy that this episode gives some of the other characters a bit more time to shine in the lead, especially Willow. Spike overhears Angel talking about Buffy being on her own and helpless, and tells some of the monster children to find her and kill her. While being attacked by Larry the Bully from earlier dressed as a pirate, Buffy gets saved by Soldier Xander, and the others help to get her away when Spike and his demons show up. Giles and Willow go to Ethan's shop, and when Giles sees Ethan, he immediately tells Willow to leave. And here's where the other cool part of this episode comes in. It seems the two know each other, and Ethan calls Giles Ripper, whatever the fuck that means. Ethan calls them old mates, and Giles seems surprised that he didn't guess it was Ethan behind this because the stunt was sick, brutal, and harms the innocent. Oh, and we all know that you are the champion of innocence and all things pure and good, Rupert. Ethan makes some more allusions to mild-mannered Giles being dangerous and how nobody in Sunnydale knows it. Giles tells Ethan to break the spell and leave or else he'll kill him, then beats the shit out of Ethan. The rest of the gang find a warehouse but get overrun by Spike and his guys, and just when Spike's about to kill Buffy, Giles gets the answer of how to break the spell from Ethan, who then disappears. Buffy, back to her old self, easily dispatches Spike who runs away since his minions are now children again so he has no backup. Willow wakes up back where her body was and decides not to cover herself with the ghost costume. Alright yeah, I can get behind Willow gaining some confidence. And then she walks past Oz's van and we get another moment same as we got in the Mummy episode where Oz is openly impressed by her and wondering who she is. Back at Buffy's, Angel reveals that he actually hated the noble women from back when he was 18 and they make out. Good for them. It's what the ancient Irish tradition of Halloween is all about. Getting some. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> oh, I keep laughing at the end of that line whenever I, I've read it like five times now. Lastly, Giles heads back to the costume shop to find the place hastily cleaned up and a note simply saying be seeing you. And the episode ends with the thought in my mind of what the hell is up with Giles' backstory. I never even thought about the possibility of Giles getting backstory, but now that it's happened, I guess it makes sense. He's one of the few original main cast who you can actually give backstory to because he's like not a teenager. And as soon as it happened, I was immediately intrigued. So like, I think they stuck that semi reveal or like, hint towards more reveals later. This is also showing the opposite of what I was talking about at the start of the episode. This is a thread that is introduced in this episode that does not resolve here and will be relevant later on. On the whole, I really like this episode both for the little Giles intrigue that we got and for the premise and execution of the main plot. The performances were fun to watch as well and the Halloween aesthetics were great. I just think it was solid out and definitely one of my favourite episodes so far. Episode 7, Lie to Me. This episode opens with an encounter between Drusilla and Angel which Buffy sees from a nearby rooftop. Drusilla tries to feed on a child but Angel intervenes before she can and tells Drusilla to take Spike and leave Sunnydale. The two then talk a little and we get the sense that they have history. Drusilla talks about Angel's heart stinking of Buffy and cryptically says that this is only the beginning before leaving. Actually, it might be a bit redundant to say that it was cryptic because Drusilla literally speaks in prophecy half the time. Buffy, seeing Angel speaking to another woman, immediately thinks that he's lost interest in her despite multiple previous episodes of them being very into each other. I get that, like, anyone can have confidence issues, but I feel like Buffy jumps to Angel hates me now too easily and too often. At school, Giles and Jenny are talking about going on another date, but Jenny is purposefully keeping the destination a secret. Yes, I will skip the plot of almost entire episodes that I don't think are great or relevant, but I will still mention every instance of these two talking. It's my video and I get to do what I want. Uh, but don't worry, if you're sick of hearing about these two, you won't have to worry about it for much longer. We'll get there, not this episode. 
In class, Willow and Buffy are passing notes about the woman Angel was with, and Buffy doesn't think she's a vampire because they seem friendly. I don't know what about Angel's body language here screams friendly to Buffy, but I think she's stretching the truth a little. Look, she's upset, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt, I guess. Some guy named Ford shows up, who has apparently transferred to Sunnydale from Buffy's old school for his senior year. We get a lovely bit of fat shaming from Xander, which is just the time period of the show all over, I guess. And we get a name drop of the certified banger I Touch Myself by Divinals. Oh, that's what that song is about? Ford joins the gang playing pool at the bronze, and Buffy runs into Angel, who tells her that he just stayed in last night and read. Buffy, obviously upset since she knows Angel was with Drusilla, decides to take a walk with Ford and ends up running into a vampire. She tries to get Ford to head back to the bronze while she fights it, but he follows her, and anyway, it turns out that he knows that she's the Slayer. We then see Ford go into some mysterious warehouse with massive metal doors being installed. This will become relevant later, I'm not just some kind of door fiend who wanted to mention it but if someone did actually have a sexy door from titanic costume like i was talking about earlier i mean it hit me up people there are dressed like stereotypical vampires talking about some plan and watching the movie dracula ad 1972 with peter cushing and christopher lee when looking up what that movie was um, I saw that there's a character in it named Johnny Alucard, which <laughs> sounds like something I would use to, like, bust someone's balls. Hey, who's this guy fucking Johnny Alucard over here? Come on. Angel visits Willow in her room, and I do appreciate that they remain committed to the vampire lore by her having to invite him in. Vampire rules are so silly, and also my favourite thing about vampires. Angel, whose makeup is done especially pale in this scene, I think, asks Willow to look up for it on the internet. Except he calls it the net. On the net. He insists that he's not jealous and just has a bad feeling about Ford, and there's immediately something up since Ford isn't in the school records, which Willow can access immediately and easily from her home computer. Angel has to leave before they find anything else, and he tells Willow not to tell Buffy what they're doing. Ah, huh, there sure is a lot of lying in Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 2 Episode 7 titled Lie to Me, isn't there? Bit suspicious. Willow, despite being the worst liar in the world, manages not to give away what they're doing. And then Giles tells Buffy that he'll be away on a date with Jenny tonight, but gives her Jenny's beeper number. Kids, a beeper or a pager was a device from pre-mobile phone ubiquity times which, to be honest, I think the TV shows use as a plot device way more than they were actually used in real life. I'm, I'm convinced of this. Though they are fairly before my time, so I guess I don't know for sure. It's just my personal conspiracy theory. But like, I, I've never seen one in real life. I'm, I'm really not sure that they actually existed. <laughs> Though pagersdirect.net is still going strong in the year of our lord 2023. I got curious while writing the script. That night, Ford and Buffy run into some vampires and get separated while fighting them. Ford threatens one of the vampires with a stake and cross, saying that he'll let her go if she tells him what he wants to know. We don't find out what it is he wants to know, and then when Buffy comes back, he says that he killed the vampire. Meanwhile, Xander, Willow and Deadboy, that's Xander's new nickname for Angel, head to the Sunset Club, that warehouse with the big doors we saw earlier. They get in by saying they're friends of Ford and go exploring this vampire fan club. A very earnest girl who calls vampires the lonely ones talks about how they're above humans, so it seems this group holds vampires with a certain reverence. Then we get this great moment with Angel. These people don't know anything about vampires. What they are, how they live, how they dress, With this moment and another one earlier where Angel talks about getting good at brooding, this show is getting more self-referential. To give it a modern comparison, it feels a little like the Marvel style of writing that is getting more and more scrutiny for being a little oversaturated. I mean, it makes sense because the current Marvel style seems very influenced by Joss Whedon's original two Avengers movies. This man truly has so much to answer for. Um... He's right behind me, isn't he? Ah! That was meant to be a joke. I don't know where he came from. But I think it suits Buffy, which is a silly kind of show, and it also comes from before this type of writing was oversaturated. 
With Ford gone home, Buffy, Giles and Jenny convene at the school library to talk about the two vampires she found on campus. And does this school have security at all? Like, do they care that people are just hanging out in the library in the middle of the night? Also, it turned out Miss Callender brought Giles to a monster truck show and he hated it. And I'm very disappointed that this happened off screen. Buffy sees a photo of Drusilla in Giles' notes and when Giles goes to get a book that might help them research, a vampire jumps out of his office holding a book. But not just any vampire, the vampire that Ford said he killed earlier. At the vampire warehouse, uh, Spike's vampire warehouse, not the other vampire warehouse with the fake vampires. Actually, Spike's vampire warehouse would be a great name for a shop. Anyway, Ford drops in on Spike and Drusilla and says that he'll give them Buffy if they make him a vampire. Buffy and Angel talk about Drusilla and Angel reveals that he drove Drusilla insane by killing everyone she loved before then turning her into a vampire. Ugh. But he's good now, remember? Then he reveals about Ford worshipping vampires and the next day Buffy confronts Ford at the Sunset Club. It turns out that he expected her to confront him and that this was a trap. Oh, those big heavy doors from earlier? You better believe they're back. Chekhov's door, baby. The doors can only be opened from the outside, so now the vampire wannabes and Buffy are going to wait until sunset for Spike and his gang to come here, kill her, and, they think, turn them into vampires. But Spike and the gang are just going to eat them all. Also, I'd like to issue a redaction. This place is less like a warehouse and more like a bunker. But I think that those two structures have a similar vibe, and vampires apparently like that vibe. We get a reveal that Ford has brain cancer and his reason for wanting to become a vampire isn't because he worships them like the others but so he won't die. Just a random observation but along with the kid from the talent show in the first season this is the second teenage boy with brain cancer so far in this show. It's just weird that they did that twice. Buffy tries to convince Ford to help her stop this, but he refuses. She also says that if the vampires come in here and start feeding, she'll kill him herself. Spike and his cronies arrive in a car, because that's just how he rolls, and surprising nobody, they start attacking everyone in the bunker. But when Buffy gets to Drusilla and threatens her with a stake, Spike orders the vampires to let everyone go. Then Buffy leaves the vampires and Ford behind the door that can't be opened from the inside. I did enjoy seeing an example of just how dedicated to Drusilla Spike is because as soon as Buffy holds a stake to her, Spike does exactly what Buffy says without hesitation. Someone might see it as contrived, but I think it's good characterization, especially since we've seen how affectionate he is towards Drew. Later, we see Buffy laying flowers at Ford's grave with Giles, and when Ford rises from the dead as a vampire, she stakes him, making good on her earlier promise to kill him. We also get a moment tying back to the theme of the episode where, after feeling betrayed at being lied to by multiple people earlier, Buffy asks Giles if life gets easier as you grow up. What do you want me to say? Lie to me. One quick thing to say before we move on, Buffy does tell Angel that she loves him in this episode. And like, there's a bit of emphasis on it, but I thought it was a little glossed over because it's not even like the focus of the scene where it happened. So to mention it at the time while I was talking about the other events, it probably would have felt very out of place because I think it's a pretty big moment, but the show obviously doesn't agree. Anyway, I wanted to mention it so we're all up to date on Buffy and Angel's ongoing relationship. Okay, we're all good? Yeah? Cool. Let's go into episode 8, The Dark Age. This episode opens with a man looking for Giles on the school grounds, who then gets killed by some kind of zombie woman who he calls Deidre, who then herself turns into goo. Uh, okay, yeah, let's roll with it. The next day, Giles wakes up from a nightmare about what looks like some kind of satanic ritual involving tattoos. At school, Giles tells the gang that tonight is important, not for supernatural reasons, but because there's a monthly delivery of blood to the hospital, and they make a plan to meet there this evening. Then we get some fun flirting between Giles and Jenny, and... No. Dear God, it's, it's happening. They fucking kiss, hell yes! Oh, and they're obliquely talking about fucking here, probably as directly as you could on TV at the time. Let's see if I can make you squirm.
if you hadn't noticed already, this is a Giles episode. I was thinking about condensing this one as well since the next two episodes coming up are very important for the story and I need to go through them fully, but this one has some great exploration of Giles as a character and his really interesting backstory. There are cops waiting for Giles in the library who take him to the morgue since the man who died had a slip of paper with Giles' name on it. The man was Philip Henry, an old friend of Giles from London who he hadn't spoken to in 20 years. And Philip has this odd looking tattoo on his bicep which Giles tells the detective he doesn't recognise. Lying to the cops. Giles knows what's up. Giles doesn't show up to the hospital so Buffy and Angel fight the vampires together and save the blood. Buffy visits a haggard looking Giles who shoos her away before then making a call to the UK asking about an old friend, Deidre Page. Unsurprisingly, Deidre's dead, so Giles scratches her name off a list with four others. The two names left not crossed off, Ethan Rain, the Halloween guy, and Rupert Giles. We see that Giles has the same tattoo that we saw on Philip earlier, and then finally he says this. So... You're back. I really enjoyed Anthony Head's performance in this episode. He gets to do a lot more with the character than he's done before, and I think he does very well with it. What really sells it for me though, and we saw a bit of this in the Halloween episode as well, is his ability to get angry and turn to this ripper side, but then to still feel believably like Giles. It's a very different side to Giles, of course, but the acting sells it for me that this man has another side to him, not just that he's acting way out of character for shock value. Back in the morgue, our buddy Philip is up and about again and feeling so good that he attacks the morgue attendant. During a fun Saturday school session, Buffy talks to the rest of the gang about Giles' behaviour and ends up running into Ethan from the Halloween shop in the library stacks. They call Giles and Buffy asks him about the Mark of Igon. Ha, <laughs> that's me if I lost an eye. Um, cause, cause I'm Mark and, and my eye would be gone. It's a thinker. Zombie Philip attacks Buffy in the library and they end up locking him in a cage while also stopping Ethan from escaping. I kind of love that this zombie man found a nice suit and shirt before he left the morgue. He might be a mindless zombie, but he still has decorum. Giles and Ethan are having a tense conversation when Philip escapes, knocking Miss Callender out in the process. Then he spasms, falls, and turns into some goo that touches off Jenny's hand. While Giles holds Jenny in a way that I wish he'd hold me, we see something flash in Jenny's eyes which can only mean bad things in this show. Ethan gets away and Giles refuses to answer any of Buffy's questions about what's going on, so she and the other Scoobies go searching. I'll try the net. At this point in the show, Cordelia is pretty much a fully-fledged member of the Scoobies as well, just to confirm that. The gang find that the Mark of Igon... Yeah, you, you remember is an ancient Etruscan symbol tied to a demon who exists by possessing a host's body. It can possess the dead, but only for a limited time before it has to jump to the nearest dead or unconscious host to keep living. At Giles' house, Jenny rips the phone cord from the wall and tries to get Giles to bang, but Giles resists, saying that he would only be taking advantage of her since she was hurt earlier. This causes Igon to reveal itself and attack Giles. Thankfully, Buffy shows up and Igon, in Miss Callender's body, says three down, two to go before fleeing. And when she leaves, she says, be seeing ya, which I assume is a direct reference to the note that Ethan left Giles at the end of the Halloween episode. I remember that that's what the note said because at the time I thought, what Englishman would use such an American sounding phrase? Giles finally explains that he and the others in this group used to summon Igon while one of them slept, which caused euphoria, until one of them named Randall was overtaken by Igon and it killed him. Buffy goes to the premises of the Halloween shop to look for Ethan since that's probably where Igon will be. And Ethan knocks her out and transfers his connection with Igon to her by giving her a sick tat and burning his own off. Alright, this guy's metal is all hell. I hope he's a recurring character. So far the two episodes he's been in have been bangers in my opinion. 
Giles, having felt the transfer to Buffy, shows up to offer himself instead of her. And when Igon, still in Jenny's body, is about to kill Giles, Angel shows up and starts choking her. Since its host is in danger, Igon tries to jump out of Jenny's body and into the closest unconscious or dead body, which just so happens to be the hunka hunka burning vampire. The demon that's already inside of Angel's body fights Igon and destroys it. There are two demons inside of Angel. One is hot, the other is hot. Angel is hot. Ethan escapes, Jenny and Giles leave, and Buffy the next day talks about getting her tattoo removed before her mom sees it. Giles talks to Jenny about wanting to help her since she's obviously very shaken by her whole experience and she's polite but visibly hesitant around him. They leave with an obvious rift between each other and the episode ends with Buffy comforting Giles and the two of them going to train. And I am a broken man. I think the show has done a stellar job of getting me invested in Jenny and Giles despite very limited time actually seeing them together. I think it balances giving them nice moments together and progressing their relationship without making it feel like there were any big jumps in the moments that we didn't see. It's almost kind of a slow burn but we do get steady progress of them being more and more together. And just when they finally are together, in the first episode where they kiss, it's all taken away. And it's taken away in an unfortunately believable way. It doesn't feel like a cheap breakup or an unnecessary misunderstanding, which is something that I hate in fiction. I'm sad about them not being together anymore, but I'm even sadder because I understand why. Jenny is traumatized by her experience and Giles is directly connected to that experience. And on top of that, she saw a side to him that she and we didn't know existed, so that's going to change how things are between them. It's an ending that I find impactful to an episode that I really enjoyed and one that I think deepened both Giles and Jenny's characters. And that leads us into episode 9 and 10, What's My Line parts 1 and 2. At the warehouse, Spike and the one nerd vampire are trying to translate a book which supposedly has the cure for Drusilla's vague ailment. But the book is in code and they need a key to decipher it. Spike talks about bringing in three bounty hunters called the Order of Taraka to kill Buffy and the nerd vampire seems all wigged out by them so it must be bad. Angel visits Buffy because he had a bad feeling and she talks about wishing she had a normal life. So they make a plan to go ice skating tomorrow. We also get another shot of a mirror with no reflection from Angel and I'm a sucker for it, I love it every time. It's career day at school so everyone is filling out questionnaires to see what careers they're going to have. When Xander leaves to go to the prison guard booth since that's what he's been assigned, Willow is pulled aside by two men in black suits. Her name wasn't listed with everyone else for her career and now she's in a special area behind a black curtain with a fancy waiter and hors d'oeuvres. I thought that this was going to be like a government men in black type thing, but apparently she's just been selected to talk to a recruiter from a big software company. Actually, time out while we're here. Wasn't Willow supposed to be into Xander? Like, this season opened with a very out-of-pocket moment of those two kissing. And there have been some moments slightly related to it, like in the Mummy episode. But for the most part, I feel like the writers have just kind of forgotten. Not that I'm too torn up, like I thought it was a bad moment from the start, but they're just kind of letting the memory of it fade away. And I guess it's leaving can make place for the Oz and Willow meet cute. Oh my god, yes, I am so glad that it's here. When God sinks one ship, he lets another sail. By the way, I'm dressed as Oz, if that wasn't clear. The oversized short sleeve shirt, the graphic tee underneath. I wore my baggiest jeans as well, which are like... I, honestly, not that baggy compared to the 90s stuff. And I realized that I should have painted my nails, but I only remembered that this morning, and I've already been putting off recording this video for a long time, so uh, I decided to go ahead and record. <laughs> Buffy and Giles check out the tomb where the vampires stole the key from and realise that it's going to be bad news when used with the book that was stolen from the library back in the wannabe vampire episode. The next scenes are a montage of three people arriving in Sunnydale with ominous music. A tough looking guy with one eye, a geeky salesman who kills a woman in the house next to Buffy's house, and a young woman who hitched a ride in a plane's cargo hold. 
Buffy and Angel have a cute ice skating date where Buffy is the only one skating, but then one of the three bad guys attacks her. They kill him, and then they have a makeout session on the ice, and we see the girl who stowed away in the plane earlier watching on. We also see a clip of the nerdy salesman guy from earlier watching Buffy's house, and it turns out uh, he's a man made of maggots. So that's... fun. Buffy is super on edge and decides very smartly not to go home and to instead go to Angel's house to hide out from the Order of Taraka. He's not there, but it doesn't stop her from taking a nap in his bed, like she she's a Fallout character. The next scene is one that I like a lot, and I think it was kind of included as a proof of concept for Angel getting his own show. Not quite like a full backdoor pilot, it's only one scene, but definitely showing that he can lead a scene. Angel visits a wise kraken bar owner named Willie, looking for information about who sent the order after Buffy. Willie plays coy because he's scared that if he tells Angel about this, Spike might find out that he told Angel. So instead, Angel employs some advanced interrogation techniques. My but before Willie tells him everything, Angel is attacked by the girl from the plane and ice rink earlier. They fight, and she locks him in a storage cage, telling him that the sun will start shining through the windows in a few hours, and that that will give her more than enough time to find Buffy. I've avoided as much as I can looking up things about these shows because I don't want to get spoiled. I've made it this long, I don't want to spoil myself while I'm in the middle of watching the show. But I'm pretty sure that Angel the show is a detective series. And this scene really did feel like a scene from a detective show dropped in the middle of a Buffy episode. And I liked it, it made me want to see more. Giles figures out that Spike is looking for a ritual to restore Drusilla to full health right around the time that the vampires successfully decipher the ritual. At Buffy's house, Cordelia and Xander are looking for Buffy when Cordelia lets the maggot man in. And the girl from the plane finds Buffy at Angel's house and attacks her. Then we learn that this girl is, according to her, Kendra the Vampire Slayer? But, but wh but there's only one. They, they always say there's the one vampire and she's the chosen one. What? Back at the library, Giles realises that Kendra likely is a genuine slayer who was called when Buffy was briefly killed by the master. We also learn that Kendra is very by the book and doesn't understand the fact that Buffy has friends and a very lax way of being a slayer. When Buffy asks why Kendra was trying to kill her, Kendra admits that she thought Buffy was a vampire since she saw her with Angel. Then she mentions that she had seen him earlier and the show cuts to a very tired looking Angel who obviously lost a fight with the locked door of his cage and is about to lose a fight with the sun. Willie then pulls him out and delivers him to Spike in the sewer that's beneath the bar. Meanwhile, in Buffy's house, the salesman... That's actually like a sick villain name. I'm the salesman. I'm going to sell you your death. No, okay, never mind. It's shit. Forget I said anything. The salesman bursts into a big pile of maggots and corners Xander and Cordelia in the basement. Then we see Buffy and Kendra um, following up with Willie. There's a lot of tension in this room. <laughs> And Willie lies, saying that Angel went underground to recuperate. I mean, to be fair, he did go underground. Giles has been in contact with Kendra's Watcher, and they've agreed that until everything is sorted with Drusilla and the ritual, Kendra and Buffy should work together. Cordelia and Xander are still trapped in Buffy's basement, and while fighting about what to do, they end up kissing. Now, with the length of this video, you might not believe this, but I have been trying to keep things concise. And there have been multiple points during this season where Cordelia and Xander's banter has made me think that they might become a couple. So this kiss didn't really take me too much by surprise, and I don't ship it, but it does make sense. To be honest, the bantery relationship they have is the best chemistry that Xander has on this show. They also escape then by just running out of the house. Running out of the house. Talking heads, look it up. We get a nice little moment between Willow and Oz back at the school, which just makes me feel like they're perfect for each other. Your hair is brown. Oh, yeah, sometimes. The career day cop tries to shoot Buffy, ends up grazing Oz, and then escapes. Ooh, I feel like this scene in an American school hits differently now than it did when the show was first released. We get a quick reference to Xander's experience with the She-Mantis from season 1 here, and I already mentioned it, but I do like them referencing previous episodes. It helps me feel like some of these episodes, even though they were self-contained stories, did happen and had some kind of a lasting effect on the world. 
Buffy compliments Kendra who helped her against the cop earlier. Look at these two becoming best friends. And after learning that the ritual will be taking place tonight and that it requires killing the vampire who turned Drusilla, who Buffy tells everyone is Angel, things are now personal for the gang who double down on finding out where the ritual is happening. They can send assassins after Buffy. They can endanger her mother on parent-teacher night. But if they come after Angel before she's even boned down with him, that's too far. We then get two scenes of a topless angel tied to a bed and um, something's happening. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, I, I forgot. Kendra starts to show a little bit of her human side behind all of the perfect Slayer stuff we've been seeing and her and Buffy seem to be opening up to each other a bit. Also, I'm not sure if this is me misunderstanding or if it's like a possible hint for future plot lines. But Kendra says that she was given to her watcher at an age so young that she doesn't remember her parents. So was she given to her watcher to train just in case she became the Slayer and then it actually only happened when Buffy died? Or are there actually multiple Slayers in the world? We pay another visit to our favourite barkeep and I'm becoming kind of fond of him now, I hope he shows up again. Buffy stupidly lets him lead her to where he says the ritual is happening and Kendra lets her go because Buffy isn't following procedure. And guess what? It gets Buffy caught by the Order of Taraka assassins and brought to the church where the ritual is happening. Oh. Actually that last part is pretty handy because she wanted to find the church where the ritual was happening. Kendra shows up to save Buffy and the rest of the gang are close behind too. Everyone gets involved in the fight and Spike has to take Drusilla away earlier than intended, hoping that it was enough to restore her. Buffy nails him on the head and he falls into the church pipe organ which collapses on top of him and Drew. Then, in a twist, Kendra helps Buffy save Angel, but she hates vampires. And everyone gets out safe and leaves the church to burn. At school again, presumably the next day, I relearn what I already knew, Seth Green is so effortlessly charismatic and the chemistry between Willow and Oz is just great. Cordy and Xander argue and kiss again while Buffy sees Kendra off. It looks like Kendra's relaxed a little and learned from Buffy that she can have a life outside of slaying, and Buffy has seen from Kendra's dedication that slaying is a part of who she is and that she can't really escape it. But it's easier knowing that there's someone else like her out there going through the same thing. Last, we see an unconscious and hurt Spike being lifted up and taken out of the church by a revitalised and strong Drusilla. And, whew, that ends our first two-parter. I do think those two episodes are pretty integral to the story, so they're good to cover, but it's also a lot of information. Which is why it's good that we're not really going to go in-depth with the next two episodes. Like some of the others I did earlier, I'm going to give you another summary and a few choice moments from each episode, and then after they're done, we've got two more important episodes to get into. And hey, after that, I'm going to stop and give a few thoughts on where we are so far. That's going to be kind of our mid-season break, even though it's a little bit over halfway. But... You'll see, after episode 14 is a good chance to take a breather. But for now, episodes 11 and 12, Ted and Bad Eggs. So I'm sorry to any John Ritter fans out there, but we're glossing over his episode. Joyce starts seeing a man named Ted who acts increasingly violent with Buffy until she kills him and then he comes back from the dead because it turns out he was a robot built by a man in the 50s who repeatedly found women resembling the inventor's wife. That's the plot, here are some notes from it. I really like John Ritter in this because he was just a great actor and there's some really cool robot makeup near the end of the episode too. We also see a new side to Buffy in the middle of the episode before we know Ted's a robot when she's grappling with having accidentally killed a person for the first time. It's just an interesting different part to her character which I think Sarah Michelle Gellar does well with. We get some more Giles and Jenny time this episode which ends with Jenny accidentally shooting Giles with a crossbow and then later they're kissing in the library, hell yes, love is real, Chuck Tingle was right and maybe I won't die alone. This episode also has this Cordelia moment. She's like the Superman. Shouldn't there be different rules for her? Sure, in a fascist society. Right! Why can't we have one of those? I guess I have to become a fascist now. Please, that's that's a joke. Don't don't clip it out of cut. Don't send it to my mom. Please, that, it was a joke. And speaking of Cordelia, she and Xander are regularly getting together to make out now, but are hiding it. 
Okay, that brings us to episode 12, the egg episode. This one is about students, including the gang, getting eggs to raise, which turn out to be tentacle monsters who take over everyone's mind and make them slaves of a giant tentacle monster beneath the school. Yeah, this episode wasn't a favourite of mine. We do get the most dangerous kind of vampire at the start of this episode, though. A cowboy vampire. His name is Lyle, and he comes back at the end with his brother Tector to attack Buffy, but they end up fighting the egg monster together. I'm sorry to anyone named Tector. Lyle leaves at the end, but Tector... Well, rest in peace, my brother. Gone to the big vampire rodeo in the sky. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't. I can't do this. In the arms of an angel, thou away. <laughs> oh, At one stage in this episode, Xander says that they have to teach their eggs good Christian values, and Willow says that her egg is Jewish. I just like when shows make the effort to remind us of character details, even ones that, in this case, are kind of inconsequential 99% of the time. It makes me feel like they care about their characters, even in an egg episode. This is definitely the horniest episode of Buffy so far, a lot of different scenes of making out. And then that's juxtaposed with tentacles, so take from that information what you will. Also, the ending scene has Angel and Buffy making out, but Angel is outside her window and she's inside the room. Imagine walking past this house on the street and seeing a man just on the roof making out with this teen. And the lights are fully on, you would easily see them. Also, while we're on the topic of Angel and windows, Buffy threw him out of one in her house last season. How the fuck did she convince her mom to get that fixed? Anyway, episode 13, surprise. I got this chair because it's really big and I can like sit my whole, my legs and everything on it. But um, I'm wearing shoes for the costume and I feel weird having shoes on the chair, but, but it's my chair and I can do what I want. Okay, so we're right back into another two-parter. These episodes don't have a part one and part two in the title, but the first episode ends with to be continued. Like, they are a two-part episode. The episode begins with a dream sequence where Buffy visits the bronze and speaks to some of the people in her life who are being weird. I feel like the part where Willow speaks gibberish with a monkey next to her is more than a little inspired by Twin Peaks. Oh, also, Drusilla is here. I guess she has, like, dream powers or something? Joyce asks Buffy if she really thinks she's ready before dropping a saucer and walking away. Buffy seems confused, rightfully I guess, until Angel comes along and she seems to settle, before Drusilla then kills Dream Angel and wishes Buffy a happy birthday. I like this intro, it gives us like a little bit of setup and definitely a bit of intrigue for the episode ahead. Buffy visits Angel, who is topless, because the team behind the show knew at this stage what the people wanted to see. She's telling him her problems, and he keeps kissing her, which I know she's into and is meant to be nice, but also Angel listened to her concerns. So he comforts her about her worries, and they start making out. Then we get the key hook for this episode. They're horny, and they want to have sex, okay? The show isn't going to say it like that, but that is what's happening. I also think it's good to explain because this is going to be like a key theme in this episode as it's implied that Buffy hasn't had sex before. Now, I'm not going to get into like a full argument about how media and society have really enforced some ideas about sex that I personally don't like, especially about your first time having sex. You could make an entire video just about that, I'm sure many people have. But whether or not it should be presented this way, the conflict of whether Buffy should or shouldn't have sex is posed as a moral conflict. Conflict here. And no, not whether it's okay to have sex with a 270 year old vampire, but whether it's okay for a teenage girl to have sex at all. Not that they don't ever mention Buffy and Angel's age gap, they actually do in the next scene, but whenever they bring it up it's played more like a joke and not meaningfully explored, not in any of the episodes I've seen yet at least. It just really feels like lampshading, by which I mean like they're drawing attention to the problem and acknowledging that it's there, but not not meaningfully engaging with it at all, so they're not really doing anything. Anyway, we'll talk through the whole thing and you'll see how it shakes out, but I just thought it was worth giving a little primer beforehand. Buffy talks to Willow and in the PG code of this show says that she thinks she wants to fuck Angel. Girl, get in the queue. 
Willow then talks to Oz and ends up inviting him to Buffy's surprise 17th birthday party tomorrow evening. She also does something that I do when asking someone out, which is to make sure to specifically say date so that you know there's no ambiguity. And then she gets really excited that she said it and uh, she's just like me. Xander says something about spanking Buffy, I, I don't know, but Jenny shuts it down, thank god. And Giles listens and takes on board Buffy's worries about Drusilla maybe still being alive. Angel, take notes. In the vampire warehouse, Drusilla and an injured, wheelchair-bound Spike are preparing for a party complete with some kind of large packages that Drusilla says reek of death. We get a little look at this flipped dynamic of Drusilla looking after Spike, and I really like that Spike seems to hate being what, in his eyes, is probably impotent, not at his full strength, but he doesn't direct that towards Drusilla, who's acting as his carer. I actually just really enjoy their dynamic in general. And I really believe that they're both kind of tapped, but also madly in love with each other. While Buffy is talking about possibly getting her driver's license, Joyce asks her if she really thinks she's ready, then drops a plate, marking something from the dream coming true. We then get an ominous scene of a large man with an odd accent and an even odder hat talking to Jenny. The man says that someone's pain is lessening, but Jenny says that the curse still holds, and she defends whoever they're talking about, who it turns out is Angel. The man says that Angel killed someone he describes as the most beloved daughter of their tribe and everyone close to her, and that his suffering therefore must be eternal like theirs is. Then we learn that he's Jenny's uncle and that apparently Jenny, or Yenna, is from a Romani family. In case you're wondering, no, he doesn't use that word, but yes, I am going to. Then she basically promises to break Angel and Buffy up. We get a late night scene in the school where Buffy arrives to meet Giles, but Jenny tells her there's been a change of plan and offers to drive Buffy to Giles in a very purposefully off-putting way. On the way to what seems like the bronze, Buffy comes across and beats up some vampires who are stealing a large wooden box like the packages we saw earlier. And she ends up breaking through the window with a vampire and killing him at what turns out to be her own surprise party. I did think that Jenny's behaviour was weird because it seemed like one conversation with her uncle and she was totally turning on Buffy. And by the way the music goes, I think this was meant to intentionally make us feel this way. But she was just driving Buffy to the surprise party, not like, to her death or something. <laughs> Also, Oz continues to be an absolute legend when he finds out the vampires are real, and this is his reaction. Actually, it explains a lot. Finally, someone in this town is aware of the weird shit happening. Jenny brings the vampire's box into the bronze, and when the gang opens it, it's an arm that starts to strangle Buffy. Between Angel and Giles, we learn about the Judge, a demon apparently so dangerous that an army was sent against him and still couldn't kill him. So instead he was dismembered and the different parts of him were buried across the earth. But it looks now like Drusilla is reassembling him, which according to Angel would bring forth Armageddon. Look, I'm going to say what nobody else is brave enough to. That doesn't sound like fun. Jenny, in either a pre-planned move or some great improv, says to Angel that he'll have to be the one to get it out of town. Angel agrees and tells Buffy that he'll have to leave tonight and that he'll be gone for months. At the docks, the two of them have an emotional goodbye where Buffy isn't sure when or if she'll see Angel again. And then when promising her that she will see him again, Angel gives her her birthday present, which is a Clada ring. I am very happy to report that this is genuinely an Irish thing that they got right. Clada rings are very common over here and you wear them differently on your finger as Angel explains whether you're in love or not. To be fair it's an easy thing to research and they don't go like super into it but I just appreciate that they didn't fuck up any Irish culture or accents as happens really often in TV shows. <laughs> and I'm sure there's going to be no bad Irish accents in this show. Right? Just before Angel says that he loves her, the two get jumped by some vampires trying to steal the box back. Buffy gets thrown into the water, and I get that he loves her and all, but Angel jumps in after her immediately, even though the guy with the box was like two seconds ahead of him. He surely could have caught up, punched the guy, and secured the box to stop Armageddon, and then jumped into the water to save Buffy, who was floating face up. She was totally safe, like... The vampire who knocked her in didn't even jump in after her to, like, try and drown her. Back in the library, the gang regroup and Giles, when talking about the judge, mentions that no weapon forged can kill him. 
That line will be important, so fans of Macbeth and Lord of the Rings, take note. The extended gang, so Buffy, Xander, Willow, Giles, Jenny and Angel, but no Cordelia, do some late night studying in the library to try and figure out how they can stop the judge. The fact that Cordelia isn't there isn't like a plot point or something I'm pointing out to set up a reveal, I just want her to be here always. Where is she? Buffy falls asleep and dreams of Drusilla threatening to kill Angel. Then we see the party beginning in the vampire's warehouse and the final assembly of the judge who is this big blue lad in mail and armour. Also they have what sounds like live music at this party and now I want a spin off series about the vampire musicians who travel around and play at all the vampire functions. The judge says that his full strength will return in time, but in the meantime he kills the nerd vampire by just touching his chest until the nerd burns and disintegrates. Damn, what was the judge's hand made of? Like, the concept of showering regularly? <laughs> Got him. No, but seriously, rest in peace to the nerd vampire. He would have logged hundreds of hours in Starfield and still complained about the pronoun select option. Okay, okay, I'll stop dunking on gamers now. Angel and Buffy go to the warehouse to see how far the vampires have gotten assembling the judge, and when they try to escape, they're captured. The two narrowly escape by jumping through a hole in the ground that Drusilla should really get fixed. Like, surely one of the vampires knows how to work with concrete. They get wet on the way back to Angel's house, and in classic fanfiction style, there's only one bed. They finally say I love you to each other, and they kiss before we get a fade out to white and a fade back in with the two of them in bed together. I will make fun of the silly shit in this show and I will point out the weird age gap between Buffy and Angel at pretty much every opportunity I get, but I did genuinely find this scene quite emotional and I loved both of the actors' performances. This is where something that I said in my first video comes up again. I am just letting myself be into this relationship despite some of the nitpicks that I could have. If I spent the whole show thinking that one of its main focuses was bad and undeserving of my enjoyment, I would probably be having a shit time right now. But I'm deciding to be into Buffy and Angel's relationship, which is great because they just declared their love for each other and had sex, and there's nothing bad between them whatsoever. That is until, when we fade back in, Angel wakes up in what seems like intense pain and runs out into the rain before shouting Buffy's name. Intense pain runs into the rain shouting Buffy's name. <laughs> I didn't realise that those rhymed as much as they do um, when I was writing it, just now that I'm reading it. But Buffy stays sleeping and we get our to be continued. There are two things that I want to point out here. The first thing is that Angel wakes up in serious pain and runs outside, but first he gets fully dressed into trousers, shoes and a button up shirt. This man was not pulling on some random t-shirt either, he was buttoning up his best pressed black shirt. And his coat, he got like fully dripped out just to run outside and scream. Going from the like touching I love you scene to that is just peak TV and kind of what I love about this show. The second thing is that I don't like the reading that I'm getting from this whole thematic arc, which to me reads like it is only okay to have sex with people who you are in love with. This might just be another the 90s were a different time kind of thing, but I still wanted to point it out. If anything, I'm kind of glad that we didn't get anything more overt about Joss Whedon's opinions on young women's sexual freedoms, uh, because I really don't think that I need that. Like, the fact that it was such a big focus in, I think, both parts of a two-part episode doesn't bode well. I feel like as a society now, we're generally less obsessed with virginity than, like, when this show was airing, or even when I was younger. Not to say that the first time you have sex can't be important or shouldn't be thought about, but I just think we talk about it differently now. But maybe I'm wrong. I'm too old to know what the teens think, and I'm too young to know what the parents of the teens think, so so if you have any more insight into this, please let me know in the comments. But all of that now leads us into episode 14, Innocence. Okay, yeah, definitely keeping the virginity vibes with that title. We pick back up in the warehouse with Drusilla fainting, seemingly distraught, but then smiling before we see Buffy concerned about Angel being gone. Angel, lying in the street, is approached by this smoking woman who seems concerned. And when she asks if he's okay and takes a drag of her cigarette, Angel says he's fine, bites her throat, and then exhales the smoke. Smoking isn't cool, kids. But this scene fucking is. 
Angel did say in an earlier episode that he doesn't breathe, so I'm not really sure what's going on there. Maybe he still can breathe, but he just doesn't need to. My new favourite words usher us into a scene of Buffy returning home the next morning, guest starring Seth Green. The rest of the gang, with Cordy this time, but no Angel, talk about how Buffy didn't check in after last night. And right when Xander and Willow are going to go to the vampire's lair to save her, she walks in asking about where Angel is. Obviously, none of them know. Then she tells them about the judge and everyone heads to class. Angel surprises Spike and Drusilla sporting a brand new extra snarky attitude, and when the judge tries to burn the humanity out of him, there's nothing to burn. Our boy Angel is gone, and Angelus is back without a soul. Also, you can tell that he's evil now because he's started smoking. There's been a vibe in previous scenes with these three that Angel and Drusilla used to be involved. There was some flirting and alluding to things to make Spike angry a few episodes ago. The episode where Angel was tied up and shirtless on a bed. If you don't remember, but I do. Uh, oh, I do. But now with the three of them on the same side, they've got a fun dynamic that I simply must read into as the three of them being romantically involved with each other. There's some aggression as the season goes on between Spike and Angel, and oh, to be a fly on the wall of the bedroom that the three of them definitely share. Angel tells Spike and Drusilla to lay low and he'll deal with Buffy on his own. Which is the same thing that Spike did when he showed up way back at the start of this season, and that obviously didn't end up with Buffy's death, so I don't know what they expect. But anyway, Angel really has it out for Buffy, who contrastingly is searching the town for him worried. Willow also says that Buffy beat up my favourite minor character, Willie the Snitch, twice off screen, and it's a tragedy that we didn't get to see it. <laughs> Nobody finds anything about how to defeat the judge in their studying, and while taking a break to make out, Cordelia and Xander get caught by an upset Willow. Willow drops a line about Xander preferring to be with someone he hates rather than be with her, and I'm just still not convinced. I feel like this entire conflict could have instead been set up as Willow feeling that Xander, who has been her best friend since they were kids, is losing interest in her or is only friends with her because he has no one else. The conflict with him being obsessed with the mummy girl could still work as Willow being upset that he's blowing off time for them to hang out to instead hang out with her, instead of Willow being upset that he's interested in another girl. And then when he and Cordelia start secretly kissing and kind of dating, Willow can make maybe increasingly more annoyed comments across a few episodes that Xander is never around to hang out anymore until in this episode she finds him kissing Cordelia, a person who historically has treated both of them very badly. And then she can be upset not only because Xander didn't tell his supposed best friend about this, but also because he would rather hang out with someone he hates than Willow. There you go Buffy writers, uh, I am 25 years too late, but that is my suggestion for a rewrite. Buffy heads back to Angel's place and he's there acting like Angel again for a brief second until he starts mocking her about the previous night. Basically acting like them having sex meant nothing and that she was terrible at it and in his words couldn't handle it. He then leaves her crying and I feel so sad for Buffy in this moment. Putting myself in the headspace of what that would be like when she doesn't realise that he's Angelus yet? Like fuck, that's so upsetting. Jenny's uncle is back and tells us that because Angel's soul returning was meant to make him suffer, experiencing one true moment of happiness in 200 years caused the curse to break and his soul to leave again. Back at the school, Xander gets an idea about defeating the judge before the lights weirdly go out and their old buddy Angel appears. He threatens to kill all of Buffy's friends, but she shows up and distracts him so Xander can spook him with a cross, and then he leaves. He leaves in the coolest way possible as well, backwards through some double doors. Water drive. Giles says that something which happened last night must have triggered Angel turning back to Angelus, and Buffy runs off as he's asking her what it could have been. Here is where we get a line drawn directly between Buffy having sex and one of the most upsetting and traumatic things in her life, her boyfriend losing his soul. This is the stuff that makes me go, ugh. Angel explains to Spike and Drusilla that he's not just going to try and kill Buffy because they already tried that and it didn't work. Instead, he's going to try break her from the inside, just like he did with Drusilla. It really tracks with what we had previously heard about Angelus being incredibly cruel. Back at home, Buffy takes off the clattering and cries herself to sleep. 
we then get another dream sequence, this time with Buffy and Angel having sex. It's more implied, don't worry, this show doesn't turn into like, hardcore pornography for one scene. And then a dream with Buffy and Angel at a funeral where he tells her, you have to know what to see. She then looks at another mourner and it's Jenny. It's surprising to me just how odd it feels to see Angel shot in the daytime just for this one really short scene. Buffy walks right into Jenny's classroom the next day and pins her to the table by her throat right in front of her students. Like, this girl does not give a fuck. Jenny admits that after all this time, she had been sent to watch Buffy and Angel, but she says that she didn't know what would happen to him, and now everyone knows it was Buffy who caused Angel's change. She asks Jenny to curse him again, but apparently the magic is long lost, so they go to her uncle, but it's too late. Angel has killed him and left a message for Buffy who now says that she knows what she has to do. Kill Angel. Meanwhile, Xander, Cordelia, Willow and Oz arrive in Oz's van at the army base we saw in the Halloween episode, working on Xander's plan from earlier. Xander passes a deception check on this soldier to sneak himself and Cordy into the armory. It turns out he remembers everything about the base from when he was turned into a soldier, and so he knows where to find a weapon that they then steal. Back in the van with Willow and Oz, we get one of my favourite scenes of the show so far. I'd kind of like to just show this scene unedited, but I know that putting a long, unedited chunk of a TV show into this video will make the algorithm hate it, if it doesn't already, so I'm just going to describe it. Willow asks Oz if he wants to make out, and his response is to tell her that he daydreams about kissing her in class, but that he won't do it now. When she asks why, he accurately reads the situation, saying that it seems like she's doing this to make Xander jealous or to settle a score, and that that's not okay. And then, he says this. See, in my fantasy when I'm kissing you, you're kissing me. It's okay. I can wait. And in this moment, I look at Oz the same way that Willow does. I love this guy, and Seth Green is killing it for me. We get a short scene at the vampire warehouse where the judge declares that he's ready and everyone except Spike leaves with him. In the library, Buffy and Giles crack open the large wooden box that the others brought from the army base, but we don't see what's inside. When Jenny asks how she can help, Buffy says, get out. And then when she asks again, Giles says it too. This episode is pulling my emotions all over the place. They check the warehouse and all the vampires are gone, so they wonder where the judge would go since he needs a lot of people. We cut to a shot of a place with a lot of people and oh my god, the 90s were a simpler time where mass killing in a cinema didn't have the same connotation it does now. I think it's a cinema, anyway, or a mall with a cinema. Either way, the judge starts blasting a load of people at once and Buffy stifles him with a crossbow bolt. He repeats what we've heard a few times now, that no weapon forge can hurt him, and then Buffy pulls out a bazooka. What's that do? This is, and I mean this affectionately, goofy as fuck. It's ridiculous, and I have no idea how they're going to spin it to the police, because Buffy fires it in this crowded area, with so many witnesses. But I'll be damned if it isn't entertaining. So the plan works, and the judge is blown into pieces which the guys collect while Buffy chases Angel. They fight under the sprinklers, and when Buffy pulls out a stake, Angel calls her bluff, saying that she can't kill him. Then she kicks him in the balls, and walks away, saying, give me time. So, vampires with testicles experience the same level of pain when kicked in them as humans do. I feel like you could try and unpack that for a long time, and uh, I am not going to. <laughs> Giles drives Buffy home and warns her that Angel will keep targeting her if what they've read before about Angelus is anything to go by. Then, when Buffy says that Giles must be so disappointed in her, he immediately says that he's not. Giles gives Buffy some much-needed compassion, saying that she could never have known what would happen, and then he gives us this great surrogate father line. If it's guilt you're looking for, Buffy, I'm, I'm not your man. All you will get from me is, is my support. And my respect. Finally, we get a sweet scene of Joyce and Buffy watching a movie with two little birthday cupcakes. When Joyce asks Buffy what she did for the day, Buffy says that she got older. And then Joyce says that she still looks the same to her. And this I'm glad to see. 
I'm still not necessarily crazy about the conflict surrounding Buffy having sex for the first time that was in these two episodes, but I do feel like this line from Joyce is the show telling us that Buffy hasn't inherently changed as a person because of it, and I feel like that could be going against the more general view at the time, and sometimes still is the feeling, especially for young straight women. So I'm glad it was addressed, and I'm glad that we end this episode with two positive, supportive moments for Buffy, because our girl needs it. Ooh. I got myself a tea, and uh, I took my shoes off. Okay, let's talk about the season so far. I feel like this is a good place to do a quick break. Don't worry, I'm not gonna like read an ad or something. Um, my channel is nowhere near big enough for that. But I will just take some time to talk about general thoughts I have. Also, if you have been watching this long, please remember to stay hydrated. And also look away from your screen every now and again. That's a good habit to get into. Just like look away into the distance every now and again and focus on the far away. It, it helps your eyes not get strained. This is brought to you by a guy who worked in eye care for like three years and I don't have any qualifications, but I, th I think that's good advice. It's not medical advice, just don't strain your eyes. So hopefully you've been enjoying this season so far. I definitely have been. Season one was fun, like don't get me wrong, but I think this season feels much more like the show that they wanted to make. Everything is a bit more polished, uh, there are more characters, and there is more continuity, though there is more to keep continuity with as well, so I guess you can't really do continuity in the first season. <laughs> That is something that seems to come up like in my limited experience whenever I look something up about Buffy. People talking about how it's like the first show to have season long arcs and continuity. And while I'm not sure I believe it was like necessarily the first, I do appreciate how it's going about its continuous story. And I'm not a TV historian and I definitely wasn't around at the time Buffy was coming out to watch other TV and compare, so maybe I'm way off base. It's very possible that I'm just so used to continuous stories that I'm like, ah, oh, there was probably someone doing it all the time. I will say as well that recapping the episodes for this video has made me realise that the show is pretty good at planting seeds in earlier episodes for things that come later down the line. I feel like Angel and Buffy's relationship builds well in the first half of the season and it really means then that the storylines of surprise and innocence, forgot that for a second, really feel like the culmination of the season so far. Not just something that they introduced like, oh now randomly out of nowhere saying I love you is a big deal. Like no, I saw them get closer step by step even if it wasn't always the central focus of the episodes before it. I felt that it did well to keep all of its threads running throughout. Except maybe that Willow Xander storyline. And, like, I don't need to sit here and tell you everything I did and everything that I didn't like. Obviously, I was talking through each of the episodes, so hopefully you already have a good idea of that. Willow and Xander's Will They Won't They? Thumbs down. <laughs> Every time Cordelia and Oz are on screen? Thumbs up. Two thumbs up. Willy the Snitch? I scrumped. Don't ever say your friend Willy don't come through with a pinch. But I do want to emphasize just how much I've been enjoying the show's like full cast of characters and their dynamics with each other. I think the writing team had these characters fairly nailed down even in the first season, but in this season their banter and interactions are so fun. We get plenty of funny moments that aren't like necessarily important to the plot or anything, but are just fun to watch because it's fun watching these friends interact. And both Cordelia and Jenny I think fit well with the main cast as they're brought forward more and more throughout the show. Oz too too, but we haven't really seen much of him with the whole cast yet. Probably very obviously, at this point in my first watch through, I was really looking forward to more Oz, and I'm happy to report that we do get it. Alright, last thing. If you're enjoying the video so far, I would really appreciate if you gave it a like and left a comment. I don't just do this for likes and views, and I do really enjoy making videos, but oh man, they are a lot of work, especially something this long and involved, so it helps with the old motive motivation if I can actually see oh people are liking and reacting and engaging so and on that note maybe send it to a friend while you're at it too and get them to like and comment okay that's me done shilling anyway all right time to head back to the show before we continue on with the season I am going to be skipping over a few of the less relevant episodes again including the next two I didn't dislike these ones especially the first one but have you seen that runtime like this video is long enough without going into every single episode at least I assume the video is more than long enough after writing the script and now that I'm recording it I uh I think it's gonna be a doozy. 
Also, I'm going to keep using the name Angel for Angel in the second half of the season just for simplicity. But do remember that he's technically Angelus now, or Angelus as they say in the show, who is just Evil Angel. And without further ado, episode 15, Phases. I had actually finished this mug of tea probably like halfway through recording that break, but um, I kept holding it because I was like, oh, it's a visual indicator that we're still in the break. We're in break mode because mug of tea. But it was just empty most of the time that I was holding it. Now it's over there. Okay, bye. In this episode, a werewolf is on the loose in Sunnydale and is being hunted by a guy named Kane. Buffy and Giles are concerned since the werewolf could just be an innocent student and yeah, it turns out that it's Oz. They track Oz, stop Kane, and then Oz and Willow agree to continue seeing each other despite Oz being a werewolf. Some highlights of this episode include Oz talking at the start about how the cheerleader trophy's eyes follow you, a callback to one of the really fucked moments from the first season. There's also just this one really cute moment where Giles laughs at one of Xander's jokes. Yet, ironically, uh, led to the invention of the moon pie. Oh. <laughs> the moon pie. <laughs> I love Giles. Willow and Cordelia are hanging out in this one scene before a werewolf attack, and maybe my faves are gonna become friends? Also, I saw this and thought, aw, I miss the bronze. I got sick of seeing it in season one, but now that they have the budget for multiple sets, I kinda miss it. <laughs> We also get the first canon gay character in this show when Xander confronts this jock Larry about being a werewolf, but it turns out that he's just hiding being gay instead. Oh, and later on in the episode, Xander is uncomfortable about the gay character touching him, so he can get fucked and literally die, I do not care. Also, there's a moment where they directly draw a line between being gay and being a werewolf, so I guess they wanted to get in with that before JK Rowling did it in Harry Potter. The episode ends how I wanted it to and how I thought it would, with Oz and Willow's first kiss. But what I didn't expect was for it to end with a line that, if it's meant to be taken seriously, is the worst line they could have picked to end an episode. It is said by Oz, who is funny and sarcastic, but the delivery seems earnest? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, enjoy. Episode 16, Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered. In this Valentine's Day episode, Xander enlists Amy, the daughter of the witch from season 1, to cast a spell to make Cordelia fall in love with him after she broke up with him. The spell instead works on every girl and woman in Sunnydale except Cordelia, and the episode is just women lusting after Xander until Amy and Giles reverse the spell. Angel, Spike, and Drusilla are in the background of this episode, and I swear to god, I think they've started giving Angel eyeliner since he's become evil. He smokes now and has eyeliner, the two telltale signs of a villain. We see Jenny and Giles interact for the first time since the episode Innocence and it doesn't go well. I do really like the very earned back and forth in their relationship. They both care about each other but Jenny pulled away when being near Giles caused her to be in danger. And now Giles feels betrayed because Jenny never told him that she was sent to Sunnydale to watch Buffy and Angel. Hey, uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm watching Buffy and Angel. Am I Miss Calendar? I will also note that I get just a little bit of incel vibes from Xander in this episode when he is scorned by one woman and then talks about using magic to get a little respect. The point is, I want her to want me, desperately, so I can break up with her and subject her to the same hell she's been putting me through. Go to therapy, you dick. Look, the rest of the episode is just women being obsessed with Xander, including Miss Calendar and Joyce, which is so not okay. And there's also a joke later about roofies, so yeah, this episode has very little going for it. But on the plus side, we do get to see Oz punch Xander at one stage. <laughs> Xander and Cordelia do end up back together at the end by the way. The reason she breaks up with him in the first place is because her friends mock her for being with him. But we see throughout the episode that she still wants to be with him. And I do like the narrative of Cordelia doing what she wants despite her mean friends. I'm just not sure why she wants to be with Xander. Episode 17, Passion. This episode, which is going to be an important one, begins with a monologue from Angel talking about passion being the thing that rules us all. It mainly serves to make me think how it would be cool to follow Angel for a whole episode because I really like him. 
We also have the shot of Angel caressing Buffy's face while she sleeps. And while I originally thought that it was stupid because if he's meant to be evil, why doesn't he just kill her in her sleep? I wonder if this was meant to be an indication to us that Angel, despite losing his soul, still cares about Buffy. Buffy asks Giles if there's a spell that can undo her inviting Angel into her house as he's free to do so now and he's evil now so it's not good, it's, it's bad, it's bad to have evil men in your home. Mark Breen 2023. And she knew that he was there because he left her actually quite a good charcoal drawing of her sleeping. Yeah I guess a couple hundred years as an immortal being and you'd pick up a few skills. We also get a great moment of the gang being utterly confused when two students come to the school library to look for books. The gang, like me, also ask why Angel doesn't just kill Buffy and we're reminded of how he killed Drusilla's family to drive her mad. Because of this, Buffy's worried about her mother, but Giles reminds her that she can't tell Joyce about her being the Slayer. Jenny asks Willow to teach her class tomorrow because she'll be late and Buffy and Giles appear, still visibly upset with Jenny. Jenny apologises to Giles, telling him that she didn't mean to hurt anyone by lying and that her duty to her people is the first thing that she was ever taught. She also says that she didn't expect to fall in love and that she just wants to make things right with him. But Giles tells her that he's not the one who she needs to make things right with. This is the good shit. This is what I love. Jenny is sorry for hurting Giles, but the motivation for what she did makes total sense. And she doesn't apologize for what she did for her people, she just apologizes for lying to him. Then on the other side, we see Giles' hope and affection in the way that he reacts when she says she loves him and thanking her for the book. But we see that he's very likely already forgiven Jenny lying to him. What he still cares about is that she lied to Buffy. Both of them are sorry and want to be together, but both of them are also beholden to other people in their lives. People who are at odds. It might be a bit frustrating that they haven't figured things out yet, but for me, it only cements each of the characters' dedication to, for Jenny, her family, and for Giles, Buffy. This character-centric stuff is my favourite part of the show. Buffy warns Joyce not to let Angel into the house if he shows up, framing him as a stalkerish ex-boyfriend. And while talking on the phone to Buffy, we see Willow turn her back to her bed, then turn around to find an envelope full of dead fish from her fish tank. In Vamp HQ, we see that Spike is getting a little sick of feeling impotent, and Angel is getting a lot of joy by goading him about it. Then Drusilla gets a vision and says an old enemy is seeking help to destroy their home, before it cuts to Jenny in an apothecary buying something called an Orb of Thessala. The shopkeep warns her that the orb is useless without some lost, untranslatable text, but she says that she's working on a computer program to translate it in the hopes to give her friend a soul. At school, Jenny and Buffy have somewhat of a reconciliation, but Buffy seems to be doing it because Giles misses Jenny, not because she forgives her. Giles has figured out the spell to keep Angel out of places he's previously been invited into, so they do Willow's house first, but find a drawing left there of Joyce sleeping. Willow also mentions that she has to hide this from her dad because she says that Ira Rosenberg's only daughter nailing a crucifix to her wall would not be okay. Angel is waiting in Buffy's front yard when Joyce gets home and he keeps telling her that he needs to be with Buffy. He then says that he can't stop thinking about Buffy since the night that they made love. Just as a sidebar, relevant to nothing, I hate that phrase. Make love. Made love. Ugh. They fucked. And when he tries to follow Joyce in, Buffy and Willow are there reciting an incantation and he can't enter. While Angel is a pretty scary villain with what we know about his violent and sadistic tendencies, I think this episode is doing well to show us that Buffy isn't just going to let herself be terrorised by him. There's a real back and forth to their protagonist-antagonist dynamic. They're both definitely switches. That night in the school, Jenny's working on her program when Giles comes in. He's excited to hear that she talked to Buffy today and she tells him that she may have some news but she needs to finish something. Giles says that she can come over to his house later and he leaves and both of them are quite excited and happy. And that's how you know that something bad is about to happen. Jenny successfully translates the text and seems to save the program onto a floppy disk before she's scared by seeing Angel at the back of her class. Angel knows about the Orb of Thessala and smashes it in front of Jenny. He then talks about how much the world has changed in two and a half centuries and how amazing it is that she's stored the key to restoring his soul in the computer, which he then smashes. 
I know this is a small thing, but I like the idea that Angel, who is 270 years old, doesn't understand digital storage. Like, I don't mean this as a joke, I mean it as a genuine part of his character. And so he thinks that by destroying the computer, the information is gone forever and would never consider it being copied to an external source. Angel, having gotten rid of the spell, attacks and chases Jenny through the school, and I was very stressed during this whole sequence. That is, until they decided to drop the funniest moment of the show in the middle of the chase, where Jenny yeets this card at Angel. How did he not avoid it? Like, it fucking cracks me up. It's funny to have that, but I kind of hate it as well because it happens right before Jenny runs up a staircase and Angel is waiting at the top, where he snaps her neck with his bare hands, showing us the brutal Angelus we've been told about. I know that Jenny isn't like main main cast, but for this season she basically was, and I really like her character if that wasn't evident. Obviously as well I love Jenny and Giles together, and so all of that meant that I really felt this death and I'm gonna miss Jenny as a character. Even with the funny cart clip right before her death. Joyce talks with Buffy about her and Angel having sex, and while she grills her a bit, it's ultimately kind of a sweet moment of growth in their relationship. We then see Giles returning home to a rose on his front door and romantic things all around his apartment. A familiar style of note simply says upstairs next to some champagne and two glasses, so he takes these and goes. Obviously, this isn't going to end well. When he gets to the top of the stairs, as the music swells, Giles sees Jenny's body lifeless in his bed before it cuts to him looking despondent while coroners wheel her body out. He says he has to make a call, and we switch to Angel's perspective outside of Buffy's house. He monologues more about passion as he watches Buffy and Willow learning about Jenny's death over the phone. Willow, Buffy, Xander and Cordelia go to Giles' house but find nobody there, and we actually get a short clip of Giles gathering weapons and a gas can just before this scene. The gang guess that he's going to try kill Angel, and then we cut to the factory. That's actually what they call Drusilla and Spike's hideout, not the warehouse like I've been calling it. But it doesn't really matter anymore because they're not going to be there for much longer. Right when Angel says he has everything under control, a fucking Molotov cocktail gets thrown onto their table and sets it on fire. Giles then shoots him with a crossbow, sets a baseball bat on fire, and starts beating Angel with the flaming baseball bat. I mean, I love Angel, but this fucker is getting the full brunt of Ripper and he deserves it. Drusilla attempts to help Angel, but Spike holds her back. He's not really happy with how Angel has been doing things lately. When Angel gets the upper hand on Giles, Buffy comes in and starts fighting as the fire within the factory keeps growing. Drew and Spike leave, and Buffy chases Angel, but he points out that Giles is still back on the floor, so she lets him go to save Giles. Outside of the factory, Giles throws Buffy off of him, saying that this wasn't her fight, and she punches him, then hugs him, saying that she can't do this alone. We see Giles and Buffy later laying flowers at Jenny's grave, and Buffy apologises for not being able to kill Angel for him or for Jenny. She says that she wasn't ready, but now she is. Finally, Willow is filling in for Jenny until a new computer teacher is found, and as she goes to her desk, the floppy disk from earlier falls down between the desk and a file cabinet. And that is the end of Jenny Calendar and my true OTP of this show. Well, actually, can she come back in ghost form? I don't know. This show has supernatural stuff. She's a witch. I don't know. There are two bits I wanted to highlight from this episode that I didn't say during the recap just for flow. And one of those is, when was Angel invited into Giles' house? I don't remember him ever being there on screen, and I guess it could have happened off screen. But the fact that they seem to highlight it every time it comes up, like when he was going into Willow's room in the fake vampire episode, she had to invite him in. And earlier in this episode, he said that there's a sign out front of the school with a Latin phrase inviting anyone who seeks knowledge. Like, like, they definitely didn't have to do that one because we've seen him in the school before. And it actually only ended up making me notice more that they never said anything about him being invited into Giles' house. I guess he could have gotten some, like, minion or vampire thrall to get Jenny's body into Giles' house, but again, they've never mentioned that in the show before. There's no precedent for it. So, uh, I sure hope someone got fired for that blunder. No, I, I don't really care. It's just something that I noticed.
Also, I thought it was weird that Jenny's headstone said Jennifer Callender when her one family member called her Yenna. But maybe after her uncle died, there were no more of her people around who could properly bury her. That's actually really sad if that was the case. And lastly, I just want to point out that Anthony Head is one of my favourite actors in this show, easily. I've highlighted him before, but his physicality as Giles and his line deliveries just never feel stilted to me. He comes off as very natural, even though sometimes he's playing a character who is very, like, bumbling and unassuming, and then suddenly he's a terrifying killer. All round, he's great, Jenny was also great, and I'm sorry to see her get killed. Episode 18, Killed by Death. We're going to fairly quickly go over these next three episodes plots, but I'll highlight some key things from them as I do. Buffy has the flu in this episode and ends up in a hospital where a doctor is experimenting on kids? Nope. Turns out it's a German demon who kills kids and can only be seen by sick people, so Buffy reinfects herself after recovering so she can fight and kill it. There is a through line here where we learn that Buffy is afraid of hospitals because her cousin died in one while Buffy was in the room. And it turns out that it's this demon that killed her so there's a personal stake in killing it for Buffy, not just saving these kids. Also, at one stage we see Joyce and Giles interact and just whatever about the way they framed it. Are Giles and Joyce going to get together? I'm not sure how I'd feel about that to be honest. I guess we'll cross that bridge if we come to it. We haven't had many good Cordelia moments in a while, but she's got good stuff in this episode, including a whole scene with just her and Giles researching. Wait, what does this one do? It asks endless questions of those with whom it's supposed to be working so that nothing is getting done. Boy, there's a demon for everything. I was actually talking about Buffy with some friends recently, and a friend of a friend said something that I've been thinking about for a while, but I haven't said in my videos yet. I think that the particular way that Cordelia is written to be vapid ends up coming off a little differently than intended, and as the friend of a friend pointed out, if she was in a modern show, she'd probably be autistic. So many of the moments that are meant to come off as her being mean are more her being unaware. Like, she's incredibly genuine with what she says, and there are so many instances of her saying something that's taken as an insult by whoever, let's say Buffy for example. But it's not said with malice, it's just said because she thinks it's true, and then she doesn't understand why the other person is upset by it. I guess I was just glad that someone else had separately also had the thought of some autistic coding with Cordelia. I imagine that it wasn't the writer's intention, maybe it was, I don't know, but either way I find it interesting to look back on. Oh, also, I think this episode has some of the gnarliest horror so far in the series. Episode 19, I Only Have Eyes For You. In 1955, a student and a teacher in Sunnydale had an affair and now their spirits are possessing different people in the school and making them play out their final argument which ended in an unaliving and a self-unaliving. I don't exactly know what the repercussions are if I say the non-censored versions of those words. I just know that actual YouTubers do avoid those words, so I guess I will too. We see multiple sets of people play out this argument and it even leads to a teacher being killed. It is cool seeing this argument happen multiple times with different pairs of actors each time, I really like that aspect. In the end, Buffy and Angel are possessed and play out the argument, with Angel obviously not dying from being shot, which allows the spirits to get their happy ending and stop haunting the school. There are a few moments in this episode that are worth mentioning for their relevance to the overarching plot. The vampires get a new base with a garden in it, and Spike and Angel are still at each other's throats. At the end of the episode, after Angel taunts him some more for being in a wheelchair, then goes out hunting with Drusilla, Spike actually stands up, so I guess he was hiding that he's actually healed. I actually wrote in my notes when I first watched this episode, I wonder if Spike's going to end up working to get Angel's soul back because he doesn't like having him around. And uh, I'd just like to say to the past version of myself that that was a pretty good called shot. We'll get there, don't worry, but I do think that I knew even going into this show that Spike was going to be more of an anti-hero than a straight up villain, so I expected him to help out at some stage. Hey, do you remember that guy in a suit back in episode 3 from this season? The one who Snyder talked to about spinning the vampire attack as a gang on PCP? He's back and, oh shit, Snyder says they're on a hellmouth! He says the word hellmouth! So it seems like the city council appointed Snyder and that this goes all the way to the top because the mayor is mentioned. 
Also in this episode we get a little bit of Willow being into magic-y things, and just in case you forgot, Spike says mate after everything, which just reminds me that he's doing a really bad job at an English accent. Mate. Episode 20, Go Fish. This episode has a swim team whose coach doses them with fish DNA to make them better, but it turns them into fish monsters, uh, until Buffy stops the coach and cures the swimmers who hadn't already turned into monsters. As for the relevant stuff, um, a young Wentworth Miller is in this episode, you know, the guy from Prison Break, and yeah, that's all I've got, it's not really a classic this one. Episodes 21 and 22 Becoming parts one and two. So here we are at the two part finale of Buffy season two, which of course will be focused on Buffy, but will also have a lot of focus on Angel. It's kind of his episode in a way, and so before we get into it, I'm just going to address the elephant in the room here. Yes, as a human in the 1700s, Angel was Irish. And yes, we do get David Boreanaz attempting an Irish accent in this episode. And it sucks. It fucking sucks so bad. I would be baffled if he had even an hour of training with a dialect coach for this. I imagine they just said, do an Irish accent and the results are terrible. What's a lady of your station doing alone in an alley with a reputation that this one has? It fluctuates between like way overdone stereotypical and him just pronouncing some words in his own accent. I would say that there was not a single moment that it sounded anything close to any Irish accent that I am familiar with, and I am familiar with a lot of them. I think I'm more familiar with them than David Boreanaz is. Boreanaz is. Boreanaz is. And that's where we start, in Galway in 1753. Galway is a wonderful city in the west of Ireland, by the way, in case you didn't know. And to be honest, I do appreciate that they didn't just make it Dublin. We see Angel, or Liam, which was his name before he became a vampire according to Wikipedia, getting thrown out of a pub with his friend who passes out on the street. He then sees a beautiful woman in an alley who he follows and who promptly drinks his blood and makes him drink hers to turn him into a vampire. I'm not really sure what her motivation for doing this was. We do learn a lot about Angel in this episode, but none of it is about this woman or why she sired him or what their relationship was like. I would like to see this explored in the future because, like, is there a benefit to making more vampires? As opposed to she could have just fed on Angel. Okay, so all of what you just heard was what I had written before I saw that on the Wikipedia article for this episode, this character is Darla from season one? Did I just forget that she was his sire or am I not meant to know that yet? Because this episode definitely doesn't connect her to Darla from the first season. I assume that it's the same actor but like I didn't recognize her with her hair and clothes totally different. Also last thing, um, why does she have an American accent? It's 1753, like even the white colonizers who are on the landmass that will become the United States probably have British accents. Anyway, in present day, Angel watches Buffy fighting vampires in the graveyard and she tells one of them that she's done waiting for Angel, that she's taking the fight to him. Oh, guest starring Seth Green is in the opening credits? Banger episode incoming. We see Giles has been called into the local museum to consult about a large object with inscriptions on it that was unearthed by construction workers. Then at school the gang are talking about finals coming up and it's important to note that Willow is wearing another great pair of dungarees. We get another flashback, this time to London in 1860 and we see Angel in a confessional box pretending to be a priest and messing with Drusilla in what I imagine is their first meeting. I find it interesting that we've seen Angel driven away by by crucifixes, but he can enter a church, like no problem. Okay. Modern day again, and Drusilla is talking about bad stuff coming related to the tomb which was dug up as shown in the newspaper article, Mysterious, Mysterious Obelisk, Obelisk uncovered. uncovered. Meanwhile, Buffy and Willow are studying when they come across Jenny's fallen floppy disk from a few episodes ago and the ritual of restoration stored on it. Another flashback shows Angel running through the woods and a Romani woman conducting the ritual using an orb of Thessala. We actually get to see the moment then when Angel's soul is restored and he remembers all of the awful things he's done. Buffy and Willow tell the others about the ritual and Giles says that he wouldn't be able to do it. But Willow, who has been going through Jenny's files and researching witchcraft, says that she might be able to. Buffy isn't sure whether or not she wants to restore Angel's soul and there are mixed opinions among the others but they don't make a decision yet. 
Also, Kendra's back because there are dark forces rising in Sunnydale. And probably unrelated, the vampires have killed the museum guy and taken the obelisk. They open it up and there's a demon turned to stone inside named Akathala who's been pierced with a sword. And if someone worthy removes that sword, Akathala will wake up and swallow the whole world and everyone will go to hell. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. I'm also not like 100% sure on why they want to end the world. I think that Angel might just be going a little crazy. Buffy's willing to fight and kill Angel, but she still wants Willow to try and restore Angel's soul in case she dies, because I guess then he'll stop acting evil and hopefully stop Akathala even if Buffy's dead. Also, remember how Jenny needed an orb of Thessala to do the restoration? Well, it turns out that Giles had one and has been using it as a paperweight. We actually did get the magic shopkeeper, or the, the magic shop keeper who keeps the magic shop, not who is a shopkeeper who's magical. The magic shop keeper he actually talked about selling them as paperweights to new age people so i like this callback but this does also make me think that if jenny had just asked giles for an orb of thessala then he would have known what she was doing and could have helped and the vampires wouldn't have found out her plan because they interrogated the shopkeeper for that so angel would have never come after her Look, it is what it is. This isn't the suggestion for the rewrite. That would be a lot more boring and the stakes would be a lot lower. <laughs> we get reminded that Spike can walk and is hiding it just before Angel begins the ritual to free Akathala. And as Angel talks about everything he's done leading him to be worthy of doing this, we go into another flashback, this time in Manhattan in 1996. Angel seems to be living on the street and eating rats when he's approached by a quick-talking, benevolent demon named Whistler who knows that he's a vampire with a soul. He invites Angel to stop wallowing in his own self-pity and to instead become something more. He then takes Angel to LA and shows him Buffy. We get to see Buffy's origin story here, which is cool. To be honest, in season 1, I'm glad that they didn't start this show with an origin story, but now that it's more established and we're learning about other characters like Angel too, it's cool to actually see these moments of Buffy's backstory, even if we already kind of know about them. Angel, uh, admittedly very creepily, watches as Buffy's life as a slayer begins and tells Whistler that he wants to help her, that he wants to become someone. And then back in the modern day, we see him in his leather pants fail to pull the sword out, get angry, and send a messenger to Buffy to meet him that night. By the way, uh, this vampire just walks into a school classroom saying some cryptic shit and then bursts into flames and disintegrates in front of children. I am done trying to imagine that anyone in this town is sane with the frequency that we have shit like this happening. I think we've had at least three teachers from this school die this year. There was the woman who got shot by the janitor. There was the coach who got eaten by the fishmen. And Jenny got killed by a runaway cart. <laughs> Buffy comes up with all of the reasons why she has to go and see Angel and why she has to do it alone and why she can't wait for Willow to finalise the ritual and everyone just lets her go. She and Angel fight while the others in the library perform the spell and oh no, vampire attack. The Anointed One used the same tactic in the first episode of this season to get you away from your friends, Buffy. Come on. Buffy does eventually realise what's happening and goes back to the library, but when she arrives, Kendra has been killed and Giles has been taken away. Then we get a voiceover from Whistler about big moments making you who you are, and a to be continued after a cop points a gun at Buffy and tells her to freeze. Buffy is in the process of being arrested when she assaults the cop arresting her and runs. Then she visits the hospital in disguise where Xander has a broken hand and Willow is in a coma due to head trauma. Angel threatens to torture Giles unless he tells him what went wrong with the ritual to free Akathala, and Joyce is intimidated by some detectives about Buffy. At Giles' house, Buffy meets Whistler, who's talking about evening the score between good and evil, and asks Buffy what she's willing to give up. He also talks about being all we have, and he talked to Angel too, as if he's part of some bigger group. I assume that this is very early seed planting for stories way down the line of bigger groups at play, maybe one of whom Whistler is tied to? A cop threatens Buffy with a gun, but someone beats him up to save her, and that someone is Spike. Turns out Spike doesn't want to destroy the whole world yet, I mean, yeah, vampires just get to hang out and be cool and drink as much blood as they want. And also, one of the reasons he lists for not wanting the world to be destroyed is because it has Manchester United. 
I feel like Joss was like, oh, soccer, British people like that. And we're still trying to convince literally anyone that Spike is British. I will say that any accent he's trying is definitely not a Manchester or even Northern English accent. They probably just picked Manchester United because that's a very recognisable name. They probably did not know where Manchester was. Spike and Buffy punch a little bit more because they hate each other, but they eventually head inside to talk about killing Angel to stop the world being destroyed. And because Spike wants him and Drew to go back to how things were before Angel showed up. You know, like an enemy of my enemy kind of thing. Xander talks to Willow, who's still in a coma. He calls her his best friend and tells her he loves her right when she begins to wake up, and she thinks it's Oz, who then actually does show up. Buffy and Spike get spotted by Joyce, who questions Buffy about where she's been, then a vampire attacks and Buffy stakes it right in front of Joyce before finally telling her that she's a vampire slayer. We then get this great cut from Buffy talking to Willow on the phone about how she found out where Giles is. I got a lucky break. What? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Spike and Buffy hash out a deal while Joyce asks Buffy questions that are just thinly veiled queer jokes. It's the 90s, I wasn't really expecting much better. After Spike leaves, Buffy and Joyce fight and Joyce gives Buffy the ultimatum that if she leaves the house, she can't come back. Then Buffy leaves. I really like Joyce in this scene, especially after Buffy keeps saying that she can't explain. Joyce says, I am your mother and you will make time to explain yourself. Also, totally out of line that Buffy overpowers Joyce when she's trying to leave because Buffy has like superhuman strength. She could really have hurt her. Willow takes charge in the hospital room and decides to try the restoration spell again since they didn't finish it the last time. And back in the mansion, Giles is still resisting Angel's torture because he's Ripper for fuck's sake. The man's a beast. Killick. Spike convinces Angel not to kill Giles and to instead use Drusilla to trick him into thinking he's talking to Jenny, to whom he then tells the secret to waking Akathala. That secret is that Angel needs to use his own blood for the ritual where before he used some random guy as a sacrifice. Buffy returns to the library to get a magical sword that Kendra had brought with her that I really cannot believe wasn't taken in as evidence by the police. Then again, Snyder does say that the police in Sunnydale are idiots before he expels Buffy who walks away with the sword. Then Snyder makes a call on his phone and says to tell the mayor that he has good news. I think the whole thing with the mayor is also set up for later stories because he's been mentioned twice now and I assume that as we go along the story will become more about the town as a whole than just the school. I hope so anyway, I think that would be fun. But I do wonder about Snyder's angle. I assumed at first that he and the council and the mayor are maybe also fighting against the forces of the Hellmouth. It's always a fun narrative when two people want the same thing but are opposed because they don't realise they're both actually on the same side. And that could work with Buffy and Principal Snyder. But maybe by expelling Buffy, Snyder is trying to drive Buffy away from Sunnydale because the mayor doesn't want a slayer around. I guess we don't even know if Snyder Snyder and the mayor know if Buffy is the slayer? <laughs> bars! <laughs> Fucking bars. I really don't know but I hope that we find out because otherwise this would be a huge dropped ball. Buffy visits Whistler again who tells her that Angel's blood is the key to freeing Akathala but that spilling his blood again after that will send them both back to hell. Xander meets Buffy outside the vampire's mansion and purposefully doesn't tell her that Willow is trying to restore Angel's soul, even though Willow told him to tell her that. I'm sure that decision won't lead to Buffy experiencing the most traumatising thing of her already very traumatised life so far. All because Xander is jealous of Angel being with Buffy. Or if he's not jealous, he's at least assuming that he knows what's best for her and totally like white knighting the situation. Earlier in this episode, Xander tries to use Jenny's death as justification for killing Angel. But that doesn't convince me at all because one, Xander always disliked Angel even before he killed Jenny. And two, Giles, the person who actually loved Jenny, doesn't agree with him. So Xander, by my estimation, is just continuing to be a total piece of shit. Both Angel and Willow begin their respective rituals and Angel's pants are so distracting. Like, they are kind of a look, but this is the dramatic climax of the whole season. I don't want to be focusing on pants. Or, for the British people watching, trousers. 
Buffy shows up to fight, stopping the ritual, and Spike attacks Angel while Xander gets Giles out. Drusilla attacks Spike and the two of them fight while Buffy is distracted by the last vampire who I don't think has a name. This all leaves Angel free to take the sword from Akathala. I guess Akathala needs time to wake up because Buffy and Angel have enough time to have a sword fight. In this fight, by the way, David Boreanaz is gripping his sword with his index finger wrapped above the crossguard, touching the blade? Come on, man, Angel surely learned how to hold a sword in the last 270 years. There's a great character moment from Spike where, after choking Drusilla out, which, by the way, doesn't make sense because vampires don't need to breathe as confirmed by Angel in a previous episode, but Spike sees Angel with the upper hand on Buffy, realises that Angel's going to kill her, then shrugs and walks away to drive off with Drusilla in a blacked out car that I have no idea how he can see out of while driving. Spike in this episode is so true neutral, it's great. He allied himself with Buffy and was happy to do so as long as it worked towards his goal. But now he has Drew and he's peacing out because that was the deal, that was all he cared about. He doesn't need Buffy. If this was a villain redemption arc, this would be the moment that he finally shows heart and affection for the main character and goes in and saves her even though he doesn't have to. But he shows no remorse because it's not a redemption arc, he has no remorse, He's a literal demon. By the way, Willow seems to become inhabited by some kind of entity because she starts chanting the Ritual of Restoration in an unknown language. Just when Buffy's getting the upper hand on Angel and about to kill him, the Ritual of Restoration finishes and she sees his soul return. He doesn't remember anything, he doesn't know what's going on, and they hug and kiss, but Buffy sees the portal opening behind him. She tells Angel to close his eyes, she kisses him again, and then she stabs him with the sword, sealing him and Akathala away in hell. After this, we see Joyce in Buffy's room, which has been cleared of most of the belongings, reading a note presumably left by Buffy. At school, Giles, Xander, Willow, Oz and Cordy all talk about not having seen Buffy, but say that she'll have to turn up eventually because they have school, not realising that she was expelled. Then we see Buffy across the street, watching on sadly before walking away with a rucksack and hopping on a bus out of Sunnydale, ending the second season of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I thought this was a great finale. I know that during the episodes I do poke fun at certain parts of the show, but when it comes down to it, the emotions do hit me. Even watching Angel's death again when I was writing the script, I got emotional. I think it's really well done. And that's me getting emotional even though I know this guy isn't dead forever. He has an entire spin-off show named after him. And yet the episode still made me invested because it sets up and focuses so well on Buffy's feelings about this. She has to kill the person who she loves, even when he doesn't know what's going on or else the entire world will be sucked into hell. It's heartbreaking, even presumably knowing that he'll come back at some stage, because it's not about the fact that he's gone forever, it's about Buffy's emotions in that moment. I'm actually really interested to see how and when he does come back. I imagine it'll be like the middle of season 3, or maybe even the finale. But for now, that's it. That's our last episode. We did it! Season 2 of Buffy in the bag. Well, I mean, you just sat and watched a video, I did a bit more. I thought this season was pretty much an improvement in all elements over the first. Obviously, they had more episodes so they could set up more plot, and they had a lot of that foundational work that had been done in the first season. But all of it ended up making for a really fun season of TV. When I think about my least favourite episodes in the season, it does tend to be the Monster of the Week style ones. Sorry, I'm sure there are diehard fans of the Inca Mummy Girl or the Egg episodes out there, but those two and the Fishman one, they were very forgettable, I thought. And it's not just that I dislike them because their plots are self-contained. Halloween, for example, or Lie to Me are both episodes that have, for the most part, a totally contained story within their 20-minute runtime. But they both have very interesting premises, and I like how both of them also incorporate the overarching villains from the season. This season was also helped by the fact that Spike is a lot of fun to watch, and I think he makes for a good villain. And then you have the switch to Angel as a villain halfway through, which of course is very compelling because you've spent a season and a half getting to know him and like him, or I have anyway. 
The Scoobies continue to be even more of whatever they were for the first season. For almost everyone, that's more likeable and fun, and for Xander, it's more a piece of shit. Sure, you can make the argument that he's a teenage boy making stupid decisions, and um, I think he's awful. Whereas Willow, Cordelia, Giles and Oz all continue to grow in my estimation. Also, rest in peace Jenny. And the nerd vampire. And Tector, goddammit. Damn, we lost a lot of good ones this season. Real ones. <laughs> Buffy, funny enough, is not my favourite character. I do like her, and I think that she's best suited as a protagonist, because she's the chosen one, obviously, but also because of, like, her personality compared to the others. But yeah, she might be my second least favourite member of the Scoobies. But by that, I don't mean that she's, like, way down. I mean, it's kind of like Giles, Oz, let's say... Cordelia and Willow are all like here and Buffy's like just below them and then Xander is like through the floor like nowhere near anyone else. I'm excited for more of the show and actually as of recording this I have started watching the third season. I think that seasons like 2, 3 and 4 are generally meant to be the best but I'm not exactly sure so please let me know what your favourites are in the comments. And also I have already said it earlier but especially if you've made it this far thank you so much for watching. I also said earlier that I would appreciate if you shared this video with a friend whether it's someone who is a Buffy fan or maybe someone in your life who refuses to watch Buffy so they can watch this instead to enjoy as well. Or I'd appreciate if you interact in any of the usual ways, liking, commenting, subscribing, etc. This video has been months in the making and has taken up so much of my time. Genuinely, thank you to everyone on the last video who suggested that I split up the episodes so that I would have multiple videos per season. But also, I'm sorry that I ignored you because I thought that one video per season would just be fun, he said regretting his choices with how long this has taken. <laughs> I absolutely recognise that I am creating so much work for myself, so in the future I do reserve the right to split seasons into multiple videos. I do plan on continuing and doing season 3 next, uh, but we'll see how it all shakes out. Also, thanks to the people who suggested that I do less recap and more reaction and analysis. I hope that you enjoyed the extra commentary, but also I did end up keeping the recap as well. That's because I do want someone who has never watched Buffy to be able to watch this. And if you've never watched Buffy and you're watching this video, please let me know in the comments. I watched Mike's Mike's Pretty Little Liars and Glee and now Lost and Gossip Girl videos as well because I'm never going to watch those shows so maybe this could be the Buffy equivalent for someone else. I actually hadn't watched any of Mike's Mike's videos before I made my first Buffy one which is kind of funny. I was actually inspired by Ashley Norton who I also mentioned in my season 1 video who I think was inspired by Mike's Mike to do her H2O Just Add Water series. I also basically stole her idea for my thumbnails which is to pose and then photoshop myself in as if I'm part of the cast. And I think we both did well. Oh, also, thanks to Ashley for watching my season 1 video, by the way. She recognised my name on her Twitch stream once and mentioned my Buffy video, and I was shocked. Okay. I think that's it. Like I said, I've already started season 3 and I do plan to make a video on it. And if I do, I anticipate it coming out a lot sooner than this one in relation to season 1. But also, I might be totally wrong, I don't know. Whatever the case, thank you again so much for watching. I'm gonna go have a big lie down. My bed is right there and I'm going straight into it. Okay, he's done.